party wagon and hold on to your pizza. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Epic Tales from the Sewers. I'm your host, Justin, and I have with me a very special guest today to cover the comic that we're going to be covering. I have Liddy, the Channel 6 chick. How are you doing? I am awesome today. How are you, Justin? Doing wonderful. Uh, thank you for joining me, you know, on, uh, the, in the sewer here. Um, this is a really big book. Like, there's, there's a lot to it. I'm, I'm glad that you suggested we cover this because uh, it's, it's kind of meaty. It's the, uh, the best of TMNT, April O'Neil. I was going to say, did I suggest it or did you suggest it? I think that was your bit of genius, but I'm totally down with it. <laughs> well, the, the cool thing is with this, you are actually helping me cover the very first Mirage story on the podcast. Like this is the first one. So ironically, it's the second one too. So <laughs> <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> nice. Nice. So um, this book actually has uh, three different, this was just released, uh, I want to say December or is this the December one? December of uh, 2021. This has uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue number two from Mirage. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles April O'Neil April O'Neil micro series, which is uh, issue number three by IDW, and TMNT number 118, also by IDW. So we can we can um, jump into this one now. Normally, when I I do the covering the books, I'll go through and I'll do like a panel by panel with voices and stuff like that. So maybe I'll I'll uh, come back and and do that. But um, I mean, this is uh, iconic. This one is story by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, art by Eastman and Laird, and colors um, which were added afterwards by Tom Smith Scorpion Studios for the uh, colored classics. So and they don't give me a date on that one, unfortunately. But um, this uh, this is kind of interesting. Do you uh, do you recognize that first panel of the book with Raphael? <laughs> oh heck yeah! Yeah, it's it's about uh, probably the most famous picture that I think I've ever seen of the of the turtles with uh, Raph with his two sides kind of like jumping in. He's saying "kiss your butt goodbye," <laughs> and we see on the next panel um, as it looks like Donatello is trying to read the book Dune. Or no, that's Leo. Leo's trying to read Dune, sitting next to Splinter, who's watching TV, and Donnie, who's working on a circuit board, and Mikey and Raph are fighting in the background. So um, do you have uh, you have a favorite turtle? I know we talked about this before, but just, just for the record, for notoriety, who's your guy or, uh, or girl? For notoriety, my, my main squeeze out of the turtles is Mikey. I know that's so common, but I just absolutely love him to pieces. It's, it's funny because most of the people I've talked to, it's it's definitely split, you know, and, and we find that, you know, it usually kind of equals out a little bit. But um, the most common answer that I've gotten so far is probably Raph seconded by Leo. So uh, oh, really? it, it just it just kind of depends. And um, in, in an interview, uh, Kevin Eastman had said that when when he does these things at uh, like panels and he asks people to raise their hand for one particular turtle, it usually equals out to about 25 percent of the of the audience likes each particular type. Oh, so it's equal across the board. Yeah. And I always thought Mikey was the most popular, too. But then it's like there are some really adamant Donatello fans out there like they are passionate. And, and I mean, Raph, it's like I, I meet another person that loves Raph like every day. So. <laughs> there are so many great Instagram accounts dedicated to loving Raph, actually. I oh, yeah. Yeah. You've got a great Instagram following. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I, I know Leo has one, but it's not as robust. So I, I imagine <laughs> it's because we're all spending time honing our skills and meditating that, uh, you know, we, we don't do that. So of course, but Raph fans are rude and crude, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your place to remind you he's the man. <laughs> that's that's a great point. <laughs> so, so I'm going to put you on the spot here because I, um, I usually go to uh, the 2003 Michelangelo and when I do my Mikey voice and I do it kind of like this, you know, <laughs> with, with, adorable. <laughs> you know, um, what's, what's your Michelangelo voice? Like, who do you, who do you hear? And um, maybe, maybe if we could hear a little bit of it. I don't, I honestly, oh, you don't do impressions. Okay. I don't do a cool Michelangelo. <laughs> like all I can do is like Calabunga dude. And uh, my kids think it's very lame. I love the Nickelodeon series. It was uh, not not the Rise of, the one that just came before that. The Greg Sips? Yeah, and I, I actually got into it with my kids and I thought it was okay. But the more I watched it, the more I fell in love with it. And I, I was a diehard fan of the previous Nickelodeon series that was a lot grittier and dirtier. And this one was a little bit more lighthearted and fun, but I really enjoyed it actually. 
and I like um, the relationship in that one. Like I love Karai coming out in that one. We don't really see her as much in the others. So I really, really enjoyed the relationships the turtles have with Karai, with April, with Casey in that one. I thought it was really well done. And I, I love ice cream kitty. I'm a sucker <laughs> for a cute kitty in a freezer. <laughs> oh, she's the best. I think um it I think I had ice cream kitty as like uh something in like a, as a character in like the Ninja Turtles Legends game. You can get ice cream kitty. And I'm like, oh, I'm totally getting that. You know? That would be my only goal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was pretty sick. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I think that there, there's a lot of contention on this because people love the 87 series, usually up until like the last two seasons when it got like they call it the Red Sky version. Right. And then yeah. like the 2003 series is like that was what this IDW comic was pretty much based around. So it's like if you like this, that's kind of where it came from. And, and it's so cool. It is. But, and it was wonderful. But, but this series, the Nickelodeon series is deep. I mean, it's it's well written. It's thought out. There's complex emotional relationships going on, and Donatello having his love triangle with Casey in <laughs> April, and and you know Leo and Karai, and you're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Whoa, there's brother and sister now. It's like this is like watching Game of Thrones. It's all so, kinds of wonderful messed up, and I love it is. I love that Raph always says sewer apples. It is a common <laughs> phrase in our house. <laughs> It's That's great. Us, we were apples, and for a while we changed it to space apples while they were in space. Oh, we had yeah, a lot of fun with this. Yeah, I, I just think too, it's like, and you think about the shredder. Like, if you could, sh- if you could sum up the shredder in one scene, it's that scene where the world's about to end, and they ask Shredder to help, and he double crosses them just to kill Splinter, yeah. and then the turtles go off into space and all that, and you're like, huh. That's why he is who he is. And that's all he ever thinks about faced with an insurmountable, you know, uh, sort of odd. He's going to complete his mission because he's that selfish of a person. And you're just like, all consuming. Yeah. And I, I know we talked about this briefly earlier and I guess we won't go into it now, but we do see some really interesting stuff going on with IDW where it's kind of developing him in a way that he's never had a chance to be developed. Yes. Yeah. Very, very Magneto like. So you know, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> but I guess we'll we'll get to that. So um, so um, no Mikey impression. OK. All right. Well, I'll, I, I'll I, I just suck at it. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is kind of a classic story. Uh, and most of it involves how the turtles first meet April. So we, we see that on TV. Baxter Stockman is there talking to a news person who is not April um, about yeah. his mousers and, and he's kind of going into it. And um, I, I like this version of Baxter because the one I go to is the 2003 series. So uh, let's see. This little thing, Miss Hines, is a fully operational rodent hunter seeker killer. We like to refer to as a mouser. So he's kind of like snooty and and he's got like that that um, air that he's better than everybody. And he's it's so arrogant. brilliant. Oh yeah, it absolutely. And and Splinter's totally interested here because as a rat, you know, he's concerned with, you know, new developments and someone making the best rat catcher. And this is uh the first time that we see April and she's referred to as his assistant and she opens up and puts five rats into the maze. And it's it's kind of interesting because I I wonder if April would be morally opposed to this now as opposed to 1984, you know? That's kind of a, a difference in the character and maybe in the times, but um, I, I don't know if, if April from IDW would feel comfortable putting rats in there and letting the Mausers kind of chomp them up. It's a good question because she is a scientist in the IDW version. So, but a scientist who has a moral compass. So that exactly. is a good point because I'm not sure how she would feel about it. And I'm not sure if she might suggest a different way of testing this, for example. Yeah, and it's it's funny too because in the IDW series, you know, Splinter saves her life and she gets that appreciation for him because he does so. And you know, she's frightened by him and all that and, and they they spend a good issue developing the that character relationship before we even see a mutated turtle. Oh yeah. So it's it's pretty interesting. I I I love the whole idea of what they did with that. So a little, little different here. You know, we've, we've got some monsters chomping on some, on some rats and, Sometimes you know, Baxter's pretty those, excited. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, he just can't resist the, the point to uh, grandstand about how this is going to help New York city in the eighties with the rat problem. 
I mean, I, I think of like taxi driver at that point, like New York. <laughs> so, but it's, it's right. Just very central to his character is that cloak of arrogance. He likes to keep tightly wound around himself. And I can't think of who he looks like at this point, but I definitely have to give it up to Tyler Perry in that uh, <laughs> 2016 version. Because now, like for humans, that's exactly what I expect Baxter Stockman to look like. So it's say, say what you want about the movie. I, I actually like that second one because of Bebop and Rocksteady mostly. So I thought they were actually very well done. I know that movie gets a lot of hate, but I thought they were dead on. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I think most of it comes down to the design of the turtles. Like if it was a bit closer to what they were, I think more people would gravitate towards it. But they did a good job of giving us who the characters were as teenagers. So nah, I, I could so. I could you know do without this their design for Splinter, but like it's watchable. <laughs> you know, but you know what? If we compare that one to the one that is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number three, <laughs> also, well, not technically named Turtles in Time, but a lot of people call it that. The writing is infinitely better. I mean, we have Donatello in that one swallowing a frog and asking if it's one of his ancestors. I mean, it was <laughs> such a the writing in that one compared to the writing in Out of the Shadows. <laughs> well, I wonder if that was a Corey Feldman uh, ad lib. <laughs> I don't know, but you know, it's so it's so far removed from Donatello and who he is as a character and his intelligence that I actually feel like Out of the Shadows did him more justice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so weird too. Like like just thinking about that third film because it's like, okay, who's developing the relationship is it is it raf and yoshi or is it or is it mikey and the kids i'm like i don't know it's i feel like you guys are mixing some stuff up there you it's know? a weird hodgepodge of all kinds of things and you're not really sure how you feel about anything at the end of that movie <laughs> yeah yeah i like um i liked casey in the film i feel like he was there trying to like rein everything together and he's like well i'm here and i'm getting paid that's like all right elias you go you know and <laughs> We got to see more of him and we got to see him in the past. And I'm okay with that. I am too. I think he was the only thing that was consistent, right? Where, it was a banging saying, soundtrack too. I'll say that with Tarzan boy on it. It totally was. <laughs> I agree. And, and so. I think, I feel like there was a Faith No More song or something at the end too, but I don't, I don't I'm know. I'm Googling this right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the good thing. That's, that's why the, uh, the listeners can't see us Googling. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just think we're super smart and know everything. <laughs> oh yeah, and that's the magic of editing. <laughs> so in in the meantime, uh, Raf ends up uh, throwing Mikey into uh, into the bookcase, shattering everything. Gets on top of him. Mikey gets the best of him and actually flips him over. Smash. We see that Donnie, Leo, and Splinter are just like, oh man, and Again. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And they're like, oh no, another piece of furniture. So. And um, at this point, we get uh, Leonardo asking, um, what, are, what are we going to do about Dr. Stockman's mouser? And then Splinter says, we must be more cautious from now on. One more thing. Let me let me think on this a bit. And then we see a panel of the mouser and he's going away to meditate. But then he can't go away without saying, um, oh, and Raphael and Michelangelo clean up this mess. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, it's it's very... Like, we've seen this scene play out many a times, different turtles. I mean, the IDW series has, has like, this exact moment in it when Raph first uh, shows up and starts training with them. So oh, absolutely. I'm sure that's a, that's a playoff on this. And then this story gets played off in that issue, which I want to say is, like, four or five or something. It's a very dad moment, and we always see these yeah. cute dad moments from Splinter, right? Oh, he's the best dad and, and yeah. also the worst. Uh, wait, no, he's not the worst. We'll see the worst. <laughs> well, I was going to say, he's, <laughs> he's got a competition there with Saki. <laughs> yeah, and he's not even the worst dad in, in this book, so <laughs> we'll get to that. So we have uh, now, um, back at uh, several weeks past, many rats are caught by Dr. Stockman's mousers, but also the city experiences a rash of bizarre bank robberies. April is questioning this. So this is the first time that we see some dialogue from April, and she says, it says here that the police were baffled by these bank heists. They can't figure out how the vaults were tunneled into so swiftly and neatly, though concrete through concrete and steel. The tunnels were narrow that only a child could have crawled through them. And Baxter's kind of trying to be aloof about this, and he's like, or a very small adult, April. Why are you boring me with this? 
Well, it's just that I've been thinking. The Mauser unit, they could have dug through a tunnel like that easily. Yes. Oh, come now, April. Why would the Mausers dig holes into bank vaults? You helped program them, remember? So he's trying to gaslight her at this point. But I was say, classic narcissist yeah. there, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And and it's it's character development that they're planting the seeds for that we see the same character characterized the same way in Last Ronin in 2021. Yeah, so, I, I mean, 30 years later, they're still nailing him. It's It's pretty great. And I just love him as a character because he's just so awful and <laughs> he's just like, he's a step ahead. He's like a low class Dr. Doom. You know, it's, he, he can't, he can't resist the, the, just that thrill of uh, giving you villain splaining and all that. No, so. he can't. And the thing is he is awful just because he can be, and he does say something to that effect in the next few pages. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So he's, he's uh, telling her at, at this point that, um, that there's a mother computer that controls everything. And um, she's kind of like, okay, I guess you're right. And then uh, April, I assure you that no one else has control over the Mausers except you and I. Come on, I have something to show you. Well, I've never seen this elevator before. <laughs> no, this is different. What's that, Baxter? You'll see. And as they look on to what looks like hundreds of Mausers and all that, you know, as they're going down, down uh, below here, she's like, What's the security check for? Why are there so many Mausers? Where did you get all these? We only had money for two dozen. And there are more than 200 in this room and still more being assembled as we speak. But Baxter, how did you get the money for? Oh, no. Very good, April. Very perceptive. I would have been disappointed at anything less. Yes, those recent baffling bank robberies are my doing. With them and the eight of my Mausers, I've already stolen over $900,000. So she's she's like just beside herself because at this point she realizes that she helped create and program these things and she is not about that life. As you mentioned about the moral compass, we see April has that moral compass. Yeah, it is something that they carry forward in all of the issues that we're looking at, um, which I think is really interesting. And I think it's one of the reasons she aligns so well with the turtles because they do break rules, mm -hmm. but it's all to follow this moral compass, right? And Baxter is so the opposite. <laughs> oh, yeah. He points straight to hell, let's say. <laughs> and you she wonder what, what put him down that path at this point, because like the next thing that he says is that he's going to hold the city for ransom, you know, uh, or he's going to take down these buildings. And she says to him, she's like, why would you do this when you could make millions legally? And, and he just says, because it's fun. I'm like, what a sociopath, you know? He is. He's a... Like, you know, how there's character development sometimes with Baxter. I think he's always just remained this genius sociopath because sometimes there is no reason there. There is like, you know, what did they say in, in the dark night? Some men just want to watch the world burn. Yes, that's exactly what Alfred says. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like he is that character. It's so funny because. Again, it's like you wouldn't expect him to have some sort of code or anything else like that. And he does something here that's like super unexpected. And, and I wouldn't have expected this in a comic, let alone a comic in 1984. But he lets April go with like a head start, which is really odd. Like it's always struck me as like, oh, that's a such a weird operation. But he did it in the cartoon as well. And, you know, different than the 87 cartoon, but he did it in the, the 2003 cartoon and it, it's it's weird. It's like he gets this thrill of the hunt or thrill of something else. So there's like more things going on with him. Well, he's such always so overconfident, guy. right? Like oh, he's yeah. so sure he's going to get her. Go ahead, have have this head start. I'm still going to rip you to pieces. Oh yeah, he's, he's just so in insanely sick. You can't help but love what a greasy, dirty character he is. <laughs> And he's, he's so, you know, polished on the outside, which is what makes his insides even more slimy and disgusting, right? It's it's so funny because when, when you said, like, the confidence and all that, I think of him sitting in the limo with General Krang and, like, he's having a drink and, and Krang's like, this is, like, the second time you failed me. Don't fail again. He's like, oh, I won't. It wasn't me. It was Hob or, you know, anything else. And I'm like, wow, he just cannot accept that he lost or didn't do anything. It's like he just doesn't see that. He has that classic narcissist profile yeah. where nothing is his fault and he is just such a genius, right? He just, 
No one believes more in Baxter Stockman than Baxter Stockman, which is why he'll give you a head start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. April, uh, at this point, realizes she can't get back up the elevator. So she uh, slams the doors to try to get away from the Mausers and ends up going down a trap door into a storm drain. So uh, it's gross. It stinks. Uh, and I guess it, it recently rained. So it's a foul smelling hole, as she calls it. So we find her crawling through the sewers at this point. And Baxter has the whole place wired. He's watching her like running man, you know, and we see that he's got her vitals up on his screen like he's playing a video game. It's almost like Hunger Games at this point, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's probably, a, that, that's a more relevant <laughs> thought to <laughs> mine. I'm like, Running Man? Remember in the, in the 80s? Yes. yes. <laughs> I saw Running Man, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kill again. Kill. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, he acts like uh, he did this on purpose, saying that he tricked her to go into the storm drain tunnels, and it, and it gives him uh, time to program her imminent demise. And he goes, hmm, how many should I send after her? Three, five, ten? Maybe three will be plenty. Ha, 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 delightful. Irony, slain by the very technological marvels which her computer skills made possible. And I, I thought that was an important piece because he mentioned her computer skills. Yeah. So, and this is, this is the first bit that we get of April. And in 1984, she's a computer whiz. So we know she's got to be smart and she's, she's into this. So. Well, and for Baxter to have hired her, given his IQ, for him to recognize her own genius and hire and pick her, it actually says something. I like it. It's um, and, and there's this test, and I can't think of what the test is, but um, the test is if uh, there's uh, female characters that are in a book and um, or in any sort of subject material, and their main goal is to be a uh, like a romance interest of something like that, then it doesn't pass that test. So I'll, I'll have to look up what that's called, but um, it, it's one of those things. And it's like starting out from the get-go, we have a capable female character in 1984, you know, who is not defined by a relationship. She's defined by her skills and her actions, which is super progressive for comics at the time. It is. And immediately she's speaking up, right? Exactly. Like, you know, she's figuring this out and, and horrified by it. And I think this is one of the reasons that April's always been such a strong character because she has that voice, you know, and, and this is this is Kevin and Peter, you know, speaking through this character. And, and I mean, like everything that they've pulled from, whether it's like Wonder Woman or Big Barda or um, I'm trying to think maybe Black Canary at the time and Electra, like these sort of characters and all that, all very different and diverse. But like there's little elements of all of that that's kind of like put into April. And which I think is cool because now 30 something years later, she's a character that people pull from and be like, Oh, I would really like to make someone like April O'Neil. Well, and she's been a really good example for all the women who got into comics. Mm -hmm. because a lot of the time you don't find yourself represented or you think, Hey, yeah, that's a really hot character. She's gorgeous, but you don't like what that character necessarily does. Yeah. And she doesn't have to be there and just look cute. You know, no, that's it. And I mean, April had so many choices there when she found out what Baxter was doing. She could have tried to get in on it and, you know, continue programming mousers, maybe make a few bucks. She could have decided to run away right then and there or tried to. She was standing there and, and basically telling him off for what he's doing. Yep. That's fancy. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's also the fact that she's taking a stand, first of all, against her boss which is, is like, that's, that's huge to itself. And then again, someone who's doing something reprehensible and could potentially be hurting people. So, I mean, this, this is a strong character who's going to have a strong influential voice for years to come. So yes, from the very beginning. So she's, she's running away and it, it doesn't take very long for the Mausers to get her. We could see that the, the red lights on their heads are shining on her and they found her and she is cornered. And there's only three of them at this point. And then you know, just like uh, probably very similar to the uh, the movie scene, how we we um, we see she gets uh, taken by the thugs. You know, it's kind of dark, but then you like hear some things. We see uh, it looks like a bow staff crashes the light on top of one. One's head gets uh, cut off, and then the other one gets a sigh right through the sensor. And April's just looking on as she sees Leonardo, Raphael, and Donatello made quick work of these, and they're just looking at her. And um, let's see the next part, she just. I can't deal with this and just passes out. And part of me used to hate that. I'd be like, oh, damsel in distress. But then if I think about it in, in realistically, what would I have done? <laughs> 
she probably just had adrenaline crash because she was running from these mousers and here these giant turtles are saving her and that's so, totally fair, fair too. enough yeah like like in what you're saying too it's like in terms of the reaction you know we're we're at a point where it's like we have to accept that she did that but again after like talking about the build-up for that we have the character maybe it's not like that who knows so but um we we definitely see her wake up and uh splinters there and it looks like uh, let's see who's it's, it's kind of hard to tell who these guys are but it looks like uh michelangelo is next to him with Raphael, and um they um they kind of uh, discuss what's happening and she's like, Oh my God, you guys are real. Where am I safe in our home? Who? My name is Splinter and I am a rat. I am also the teacher of these turtles who rescued you. And they do the classic in, you know, uh, introduction, Leonardo, Donatello and Raphael. And this is also Michelangelo who was here at home with me. And he's like, I, I. find that very funny. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's, like, I feel this is the scene from the movie, from the 1990 uh, one movie, where it's like, oh, okay. But they go into, like, instead of doing a whole brand new retread, like maybe a Batman or a Spider-Man comic, you know, they're just like, oh, see issue number one for the origin of the Ninja Turtles. I'm like, <laughs> all right, cool. I'm like, we're in this. Great. <laughs> and she's digging it. She says, what a fantastic story an hour later, because it takes an hour. You know, and um, I mean, she's not running away. The the scientist in her is is just interested and in, they saved her. So she's very she's very grateful. And she's just sitting there talking to Splinter and just enjoying the experience, you know, and not to mention the fact that she's living in a sewer right now and completely covered in muck. And it's just gross. <laughs> it is gross. Like if you look at her, her purple outfit here, you're like, oh, somebody needs dry cleaning badly. <laughs> And, and it's funny, too, because she had a yellow jumpsuit that was almost exactly similar in the cartoon. So it's like, all right, purple, yellow. It's kind of similar. But she's wearing oh. yellow shoes. I don't know if you noticed. I don't oh. know if they pulled that. Yeah. Um, and I know it's too early to have them be Crocs, but let's see. I can see them <laughs> on that one. But let's see if I can see these these shoes because I'm like, is she just wearing like flats or something? Yeah, it must be. Yeah. OK. Or like uh I don't know. I guess the shoes aren't important, but still, it's, I don't know. The nerd in me kind of wants to know. I'm like, what is she wearing? Are those Toms? Yeah, wearing? A... yeah, I want those shoes. Yeah, uh, that's uh, just for the cosplay. Yeah, that's good. I, I really do like the question she asks, though. She she asks them, "What purpose will inspire your lives now?" So think about it. Like she's just sitting, having like a real soul to soul with these guys that just saved her. It's super existential too to ask someone that you just met when you, you've heard them. So, but um, I, I, that's probably the start of the bond with Splinter because he recognizes something in her that she's she's looking beneath their appearance. And maybe I'm reading too much into that. I don't know, but still, you know, well, it's, instead of just it's a you great know, question, I, I just it struck me as such an interesting question and how she was really looking for the purpose of their lives instead of just gawking at them as freaks. Mm -hmm. right? she was, she's totally immersed in this conversation and really wants to know. I would have a thousand questions myself. So, and <laughs> you know, most would be completely inappropriate, but uh, you know, it's, I think. <laughs> it's just like, so, uh, oh, <laughs> no pants. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and he even points it out and says, it's a great question, but immediately at that time we get our, um, you know, ex machina in the story where, uh, a uh, shadowy figure that April recognizes as Baxter Stockman comes on to issue a warning. Uh, Greetings, citizens of New York. Who I am is not important. Well, not as important as what I'm prepared to do. I intend to extort $1 billion from the major businesses of New York City. How I intend to do this, you say? Simple, by systematically holding hostage every corporate headquarters building in this city. If I am not paid the ransom for i said for each building i pick then one by one i will demolish them the air will shudder with the sounds of tortured twisted steel shattering glass and exploding stone now that i sh now just to show that i'm not jesting and to show that i'm not a cheap kind of guy i'm gonna give you a freebie i have in my hand a small model of the rex tab building it's a real life counterpart is downtown manhattan vacant except for a few small offices since the previous owners vanished mysteriously. It will cease to exist at 3 p.m. today as he crushes it in his hands. And tomorrow at 3 p.m., 
one of the World Trade Center towers will topple unless I'm paid $20 million. So that's um, that's kind of prophetic in a way, too. It's like, wow, this has always been kind of a thing with the World Trade Center. I, I had no idea back in 1984. So but I, I mean, I can't even remember the last time I read this. But Baxter is serious and he's going to he's going to take this building down just to prove his point. And he is kind of a terrorist. It's funny that we make that connection. Mm-hmm. But really, what is he doing? He's acting almost as a terrorist. And I I always go back to like this is it's it seems like it's something that happened in the cartoons in the 80s more than than um, the comics. But the idea of going on TV to meet to like reach people now, you know, since, since the invention of the internet, it's just like, well, why would you even do that and all that? And now there's just like so many ways that you can reach people, whether it's like YouTube or, you know, um, like streaming live or something like that. So it's, it's so weird that it's like, this was that trope that existed for so many years and you you kind of forget about it too. It's so antiquated, but it's, (laughs) I think it is really funny because we were talking about his arrogance and his narcissism. So He's going to tell everybody what he's going to do. And mm-hmm. he's confident enough that he's still smarter than everybody to pull it off, even oh, though yeah. he showed his cards, right? Yeah, he's totally pulling a Riddler move. He you totally know, like, is. Like, he's like, you know, here I am. Um, the, the one thing that he did differently is that he obscured his face so you couldn't see and make out who he was. So didn't obscure his voice. And he's like, within a couple of weeks, been on television. So somebody's going to figure it out. But again, like this sort of hubris of this guy was like, oh, I'm smarter than everyone. No one would ever figure that out. And he's Very, actually um, made the point of having like an exact exact replica of the yeah. building he's going to destroy. I'm like, did he have a crony make that? Did oh, he yeah. make no, no. He totally stayed up making this thing <laughs> and it had to be perfect to scale and all of that. You know and <laughs> he couldn't have done any of this until he had that building perfect to scale. And there's test buildings because when he squeezed with his hand, you know, (laughs) like he had to make sure that it went the right way. He's like, oh, this will not do, you know, so like this whole time between everything that happened, um, he he had to have that. So that's that's what. So luckily, April figured everything out. But yeah, he's he has many of these models. (laughs) He's got like the theater of narcissism down pat, right? He has the Beetlejuice uh, house in his (laughs) his attic. (laughs) (laughs) That would be awesome. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, so we see um, as uh, the uh, the reporter is covering this, he's like, oh, nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, good Lord, oh, no. And, and then everything comes down just as Baxter has said. And, and April's just beside herself in tears. Oh, God, Baxter, no. And then, you know, um, it says Jonan Splinter. So and, and I, I don't usually see him called Jonan, but I, I think that's a, a term that refers to like a master. So yeah. this man is mad and he must be stopped. And April's just sobbing and, and um, Splinter asks her, do you think you can find your way back to the lab? And she says that she thinks so. There's a turtle's gear up and they're ready to go. I was going to say, this is massive for her too, because she is probably feeling all this guilt because she did program those mousers, right? Yeah. So, yeah. She was Baxter, a huge part of it. Yeah. Baxter's cackling on one hand. And here we have somebody reacting in a much more humane way, just heartbroken about her part in this. And, and it's funny, too, because it, it's also that question of, you know, um, you go back to like Jurassic Park and it's like you spend all this time thinking about, you know, what you could do versus, you know, if you should do it. So she had completely uh, virtuous uh, thoughts going into this. She's like, oh, what I'm going to do is going to help people. You know, there's a there's a problem because of the garbage and the rats and rats bring pestilence and plague. And so, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to help people. And he took that and twisted it. So it's not just the fact that her work is doing this. It's the fact that like her trust is completely shaken at this point. You know, um, she doesn't know what to think or believe. So luckily she's in, in there with splinter and, and the guys and you know, that that's going to be a good influence. It's funny how mutant turtles and a talking rat are grounding at this point. Like, you, you know, <laughs> like, a good point. <laughs> everything she ever believed just went up in the air. So why not believe in these guys? And for some reason, they're just like, a center of goodness and wholeness and grounding for her. That's, that's an excellent point. They are, <laughs> they are her grounding. <laughs> Which, like I said, it's kind of odd, but it works. <laughs> so um, they find, they find the tunnel, they go in, they go up the, uh, the door that she fell through, like the trap door. Leo sneaks up. Your reign of terror has ended, Stockman. 
as he puts a blade right up to his face. It's getting right in there on him. And Baxter Stockman is just, who, who are you? How did you get in here? As they see April, who's standing there again, looking absolutely filthy. Um, they came with me, Baxter, to help stop your schemes, which is a great sort of old comic sort of term and all that. And I, I just love it. It's like, April, you're still alive? Don't make another move or don't move another inch, bucko. <laughs> another another great one as Leo is holding that sword right up to him. Um, in the previous issue, he beheaded the shredder. So this Leo is no joke. Like, and and he will take you out if he has to. So and, and we get um but he'll call get, you bucko while he does. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, he's he's into like watching um, I don't know, old movies, I guess that say bucko. I think he probably likes old westerns. I'm imagining Leo's a Clint Eastwood fan. Oh, of course. Yeah. You know, he's <laughs> into all the classics, you know. And um they're they're talking to him and Baxter is kind of uh trying to figure out a way out. He ends up getting the better of uh Michelangelo and then Leo by hitting him with a knee to the midsection, which I imagine's got to hurt if you're hitting a turtle because of that carapace that they have that's like really Ooh. tough. But they so, have all those like I don't know if we call them band-aids, but you know, they have their wrappings around their knees. So maybe, maybe it's not as bad as we think. Oh yeah. Yeah. Maybe. So he, he uh, knees him in the gut and then um, goes over to activate his, uh, his system. And then um, looks like who's got him there. Probably Raph. And he goes, ah, you're too late freak. <laughs> I've locked it into the self-destruct program because obviously when you're an evil person, that's going to, you know, blow stuff up, you're going to have an exit plan that, consist of a self-destruct system obviously uh, right why not you you have to tie up all loose ends it's in the manual so he's like haha you'll all die now and they're like well you'll die too and he's like eh, you know he's like he's just kind of ha- like if you see like the the picture on his face as he's being just like throttled by um i don't know if that's leo at this point but he's just like raf shut this guy up and like the look on his face is just like absolute like maniac and then uh the next panel that we see is Raph holding his fist because he's knocked him unconscious and broken his glasses. <laughs> so he's, he's out cold at this point. And this is um, this next scene is so important because it characterizes uh, just, just two people. And it's going to be like their, their ongoing sort of um, idea. Like we get a little bit from Donatello fixing a circuit board. So we know, Oh, Donnie likes machines. Donnie's pretty smart and all that. But it's not just Donatello at this point that's trying to figure out how to stop this. It's Donnie and April working together on it. And, and they're, they're throwing all kinds of stuff out, you know, like, oh, um, and, and I, I guess we'll get to that in a second. But in the meantime, as uh, Raph and Leo and Mikey are trying to get out, they notice that the elevator is not opening and Raph pries it open. And they see that it's absolutely full of rocks. So all the excavations and stuff like that have uh, just caved in and um, they're stuck in the building they can't get out so with a self-destruct like the the stakes could not be higher so everything at this point is going to rest on what they can do to stop these guys mikey's messing around and he ends up finding some plastic explosives as, <laughs> and, and this of is baxter had those right yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's funny because this is the first time that this has happened this will not be the last time this scene happens <laughs> If, um, in Infestation 2, um, that's Mikey's like going through and, and he ends up finding like a whole bunch in the mine and they end up using that to stop this uh, ancient sort of Cthulhu type god stuff too. But I just, yeah. I had to chuckle and I'm like, they brought that back. I'm like, I love it. He's like, yeah, what are these? So, th- so they're going around trying to figure out what's going on. And um, Leo is telling them to put him on all of the support. So if they blow it, then they can uh, knock down um, the tunnels. The issue that they have is it's not just a self-destruct system. All of the Mausers are now programmed to attack April and the Turtles. Because so, of course they are. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, this is scary. Like if, if you've ever seen that, like those single red dead eyes just lighting up in the dark coming towards them and all that. It's frightening. Well, Absolutely. Imagine. He sent three after April and they yeah. almost made mince meat out of her. Mm-hmm. You've got how many hundreds here? That's terrifying. Yeah. So at least at least 200. And it's like, if you've ever played the Turtles video game, you know how nasty these things are. They get stuck on you and you have to shake them off. And, you know, it's it's tough. And I mean, 200 of them has got to be exhausting. So well, and they're just nonstop, right? They don't need to stop and rest like like any humanoid creature would. They're restless. 
Well, they're teenagers, so they've got energy. You know, I imagine they sleep till noon and get (laughs) up. They ate some pizza earlier. They're all good. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, exactly. Exactly. And um, neat thing about Leo here is that he doesn't have the dual swords on his back. He's got one samurai sword kind of set up where he like pulls it out from his side, like uh, like, uh, maybe like a Yusagi Ujimbo has or anything. That's pretty neat. He's going out of town because they've uh, got there. He's got to hold them off while they blow the tunnel. So everybody gets uh, pushed back in while Leo is, is holding things off. And then they jump in at the last minute and uh, explode the tunnel, buying them some time. So and then um, in the meantime, we go back to um, to uh, Donnie and April. He's like, damn, that didn't work. Try this. Oh, not so good. How's it going? Uh, and then it's uh, Mikey's he gets called because they're they're. Uh, starting to get through the rubble so the rest of the turtles are going to hold them off mikey's going to town while uh donnie and uh, april are trying to create something and baxter's sick but he's quite brilliant his fail safes including an electrical overload that burned out these lots of circuits I'm like okay i don't know what that means but donnie does then don't april you like picks how you up have on to give him a compliment there like he, donnie always compliments oh, yeah. baxter and continually always does he's just so sick but he's brilliant and he does this he does the same thing with the uh, was it is it it's not chuck is it um uh harold he does the same thing with harold he does. you know and it's like oh you're crazy but thank you so oh, thank you <laughs> like it's a constant donnie problem that he doesn't um separate genius from right and wrong a lot of the time and we do see that developed in the idw comic and i really think it's funny that it's already here right and, and donnie is all about human connection and, or, or not just human, but any any type of character. And, and they really make a point to say that about Mikey in the IDW series because mm-hmm. Mikey is the quote unquote heart. But yeah. if you look at this, every single time that Donnie has had some sort of conflict, it's because he was reaching out for some sort of friend, whether it's Metalhead or, you know, yeah. if it's what Harold, happened like with Harold and, and yeah. Baxter and like being betrayed and all that. And, and there's so many parts like that he's just always looking for someone that he can rely on he even somewhat gets betrayed a little bit by mona lisa you know go, going so forward actually. so so i i, I, just, I think he's interesting because he reminds me of the tin man yes like, you know he's all about logic and and mechanics and all these things but he always wants to find this beating heart right he oh needs- that's so cool yeah that's a that's a great illusion i love that you know, and, and you've got uh, the cowardly lion a little bit and the scarecrow <laughs> a little bit. So, you know, I, I could I could see that actually with, with these guys that that they kind of fill those roles. They do kind of. And, you know, when I think about him, a lot of us think of him as the brain, but we don't realize how much heart Donnie always shows and that he is always yearning to have a friend, to have a connection, to have somebody understand him. And I think that's really central to who he is. Yeah, that's that's such a good theme too that you see in in uh, Turtles comics where it's all about found family and and things like that. And later on, when Casey comes into it, and you know, um, well, they get close, and obviously he and Raph are the closest. But he gets very close with Donatello, and and we see that in the movie as well. Yes, so we do. it fits in so well with like that found family sort of theme. I think so. And uh, we we hear a little bit of techno speak from from april as well i I know it's frustrating about um how about whipping up a quick virus program that would infect the system and kill it like great if you know how to do that april that's awesome you know and he's he's questioning he's like oh no it's it's gonna take too much too much time and she says blast as uh the turtles are like we're running out of time these these robots over here they're you know we're trying to do our best there's 200 of these things and she's like wait a minute or uh looks like uh donnie figures out wait a minute they're, the Mausers are controlled by radio. Why, yes, the computer's instructors are, are beamed into each radio receiver. If we can somehow shut down all the power, the transmitter here will stop broadcasting. The computer's ordered to the Mausers. Assuming, of course, that the transmitter is part of this system. We've got to try it. So as uh, now it's starting to get a little more dire. As uh, the turtles are fighting the Mausers, we don't know if it's oil or blood, because it looks like blood, you know, um, but we see beads of sweat on everybody between Leonardo and April and Donnie who are just trying to get this done. And they know that the self-destruct system is coming. Yeah. This is getting to be life or death and everybody's realizing it. 
And I think this is this is definitely my favorite. This splash page that, that comes here is like uh, one of the second to last ones where there's all of these Mausers and they're just getting destroyed by uh, Leo and Mikey and Wrath. And it is a gorgeous page. Like, it is, but it's also scary because you get a sense that on the other side, like where, you, where the image stops, there are just so many more waiting. Yeah. And, and, and the perspective on it. Like, look at the perspective where it's like it leads to like the, the lit room where the other two are in there. So they're like doing their best to protect them. And it's just so cool. Like, it's it's such a good storytelling item. And it's like these guys just figured this out from reading years and years of comics. I'm like, it just shows you how brilliant Peter and Kevin were together. Oh, they absolutely were to come up with this. And it's so gripping because right now, like, I don't know about you, but my, even though I know how this ends, I'm right into it. And I feel like my heart beating a little bit faster. I get you. It could be the coffee. Like, it <laughs> could be like cup number eight. <laughs> but it's so, it's so tense though, because you, you get to the next page and, and Leo's like, oh no, they're coming too fast. Uh, fall back to the lab. We've got to run. And then we see the beads of sweat. It's this flop sweat that's on, on April. It's so much more intense now and on Donnie and they're both feeling it. They're, they're in the same moment together at the same thing, trying to do whatever that they can. I love oh, no. that it's unflattering girl sweat. You know yeah, what I mean? It's totally. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my like God. This, it looks like a spray bottle sort of sprayed on her. You know, it's, it's like, it's there. It's dramatic. It is emphasized. So. Oh yes. And, and she's saying, oh no, this program is set to shut off the power starting with the, the least essential systems. You mean, yes, the Mauser's radio transmitter will be the last to shut down. And then Leo comes in, Donatello, on my command, close the tunnel doors. Close those suckers. Oh, it's no good, Leo. They're already starting to come through the walls, you know, and, and these guys are just trying to figure out what's going on. They are ready to go. We've seen this in the last Ronin. Turtles die with honor. And then yeah, we have like the Mausers punching through the walls. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's tense. You know, the lights go out. Hey, I guess it worked. <laughs> it's like the last page the last panel there's a little there's a match lit and leo's holding it up and we can see that everybody's okay there's there's mausers that are just you know destroyed in there and it says the end so it, it's donnie it's mikey it's raf holding a uh holding a, a husk of a of a mouser head and then leo just with the match as as looks like they made it now they have I to love, figure out how to get out <laughs> i love april's face there <laughs> Yeah, she's she's relieved and, you know, wiping that sweat off her brow as she's uh, just standing there. And another really great picture. I, I uh, really envy who owns the original artwork to this because it's uh, it's got to be just absolutely beautiful in person. It must be. That's really cool. That's right. So that's the end of uh, our first story, which is uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number two, the Mirage book. So um, obviously I liked it. You know, um, what are what are your thoughts? uh good story timeless story like what do you think anything they could have done better you know i think we have the immediate juxtaposition of hero and villain like there's no monkeying around there's no taking their time with this it's very obvious who the good guys and bad guys are um april i guess for all intensive purposes she's she ties in the story she's what connects the bad guy to the good guy in this case um and, you know, if I just read this, I would wonder where she would go from there. I mean, obviously, yeah. I know where she does, but I think it's a very interesting story because you wonder now how it's going to go forward. I think it yeah. gets everybody really interested. It pits people against each other. Um, and I think it's so action packed. You read it and you're hardly breathing. You're just turning the pages. Really <laughs> quick what happens next? And I feel like a lot of the turtle comics do that. Where, you know, you're almost breathless trying to get to the end and you're caught up in all this action and you almost feel like you're sweating and battling, which is something I feel like is, um, I won't say it's unique to TMNT, but I feel like it is their niche. Like, yeah, yeah. there's great storytelling, but there's also all of this crazy battle going on all the time. It's not like a very peaceful comic. <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of it is based on the martial arts action. So it's, it's not just like, oh, Captain America punches someone in the face. It's like, oh, you could tell that technique and you could imitate that technique. It'd be like, oh, that's a rising Phoenix, Phoenix punch or something. Like they exactly. do such a good job with that, at least in the later series, like they really start going into all that here. It's kind of a little different, but yeah. But it's um, amazing how much story they can weave, 
yeah. into all of this action. Like here we have them almost dying. <laughs> Several so times. <laughs> sometimes, but I mean, we also have Donnie and April working together. We get an idea of how they will, their future relationship will be. We get that April is smart and capable on her own and she doesn't necessarily need the turtles as a crutch. They enhance one another. They don't necessarily... I want to say they don't save each other, but they do. But I'm saying they're kind of all equals. Yeah. You don't, you know, you don't feel bad for her. Like, oh, she's the weak one in the group. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And and there are times that you kind of get that. And I think starting out in the 87 cartoon, you feel that way. But then yeah. when that becomes something a little different, when um, like they, and I was, I was telling you about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Adventure comics, like the Archie ones that I loved, yeah, she becomes this whole other thing. Where it's like she's she's this uh, globe trotting reporter that carries a samurai sword and fights dragons and aliens and she's mutant animals. like Kill Bill, and, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> like she's she's flat out amazing. And then, and then you see her in other things like the TMNT movie in two thousand seven, and then what happens where she starts uh, uh, training with the fan, the Tessin, um, in the twenty twelve cartoon. And, and actually, Fantastic. even in the, the rise of the TMNT, where she's this this character that has like different abilities and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, even then they kind of nailed it. So I, I don't think I've seen like a bad version of April, maybe maybe in the video games where she just keeps getting captured. Yeah, but, that's um, ridiculous. Where she's yeah. like Princess Peach in those ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> where she gets taken by Bowser and all that. So yeah, yeah <laughs> that's a good point. But I, I think like for an introduction to a character i think it's amazing and when you end that you think okay well they survived what now and that's just it i i would i'm i am hooked on it i'm always hooked on the what next what now yeah. something that they they managed to keep consistent which is amazing for a comic that's been running for so long yeah idw yeah. what what number are we we're in the 120s or 130s now and i think I'm we're at 129 still. as of this recording so yeah, yeah, and I'm always going, what next? I need <laughs> yeah. the next one. I, I need it. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> so I think it was a brilliant comic from, from inception. Because and this you- is this is the one where it's like they realize they hit it big with number one, and but they kind of dead ended it. So they had to make this one a bit more open ended. So that's probably why this one ended how it did. Well, and I think it was a great ending because you're so invested. <laughs> you oh, I agree. Give- yeah. And you're like, whoof, with them there, right? Like, oh my God, let me wipe off this very yucky sweat and just, I can't believe we're alive. This is great. Where do we go from there? Yeah, I, I hadn't read this one in, in at least a couple of years. And I was just like right back there. And I'm like, you know what? This is, this is what I love. I love what it is now. I love what it was, where it came from and all that. And it's just, it's so worthy. And I was just so happy to read it. It just holds up well over time. Not everything holds well over time like the word blast and you know it's like some of the stuff in the tv trope and all that it's like i still love bucko <laughs> yeah buck yeah bucko so that's the i i still think of chris evans whenever i hear bucko, bucko. <laughs> <laughs> let's um let's move on to our next part of the book here which is the uh teenage mutant ninja turtles april o'neill micro series issue number three right so this yeah. is uh the idw series and um this one the art Let's see. The story is by Barbara Randall Kessel, and the art was by Marley Zarcone with colors by Heather Brickell. So, and um, and this one kind of starts out, and it's very much in the style of the first arc of the Turtles from IDW, which was mm-hmm. like the 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 art that there, and then it kind of changed a little bit right when it got to this point. But um, it starts out, and we see April who is running from some ninjas, and April is a female Ninja Turtle. She's got the red hair and all that. And suddenly you know she wakes up. I'm sorry I interrupted yeah, you. Yeah, no worries. You know funny in this? Look at the color of her mask. <laughs> yeah, it is yellow. Like that is, uh, that's a good take. Yeah, that always ca- catches me. I'm like, hmm, are we, um, are we making space for Jenica? <laughs> well, that's, that's her coding too, with that color. Like if you look at yeah. the, the cover of the book, Rachel's in a, or April, April's in a uh, yellow, yellow trench coat. Yes. You know, she's she's representing that jubilee sort of look. She but totally yeah, is, but I, I didn't even notice that until you said it. I'm like, huh. picking up on that, I was like, why is Jenica yellow? What does it remind me of? And then I was like, oh yeah, April's signature color has been yellow. 
Yeah, this this predates that at this point. I don't know what the publication date, but I mean, that was Jenica's first appearance as a turtle is four years to five years away from this at this point. It and um, Jenica's first appearance is like two to two and a half years away at this point. So the idea was always there, it seems. And, and it I does. guess that's that's what Tom had said, is that it was his goal from the get go to create a fifth and female turtle to find a way to relate to other people who didn't have sort of like, like, um, like a turtle that would represent them. So, right. Well, and, and I find it funny because a lot of people are really pissed right off about Jenica when you're like, she was kind of always in the work somewhere. Yeah. You know, it, it only makes sense too, that she's going to be different from them and be somewhat of an outcast and be just kind of like, Oh, well, I was human and I had that life and I was an assassin and I had that life and I was a thief and a street punk and I had that life. And now I'm a turtle and I have this life. I'm like, that's really representative of who she is as a person. Like she just seems to go through these phases and you're like, all right, well, that's that's kind of cool. Like I get it. And, and when I had a chance to talk to Bram Ravel, the um, artist and the writer of the first Jenica series, I asked yeah. him where he got a lot of this stuff from. And, you know, he, he was the one who really had to flesh out that character that that Tom laid out. And he's like, well, there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of history. And it makes sense that, you know, we would have these deep ties to relationships and things like that. And just her feeling abandoned constantly. So looking for, you know, Splinter and before that Shredder and their approval, like that's going to be part of her psyche. And I'm like, that's perfectly said. Like, I get it. I get who she is. And then we get into like the, the Sophie Campbell era where we see her and it's like she's trying to find acceptance with new friends. She's trying to find acceptance and learn a new skill so she can hang out with her friend, the pig. I forget her name, you know, and um, yeah, the pig, too. I, I yeah. can look it up. <laughs> it's like in and, and all these things. And it's like, yeah, she's just a really, really cool character. And and um, she does come across as like, all right, she's part Donatello, part Leonardo, part michelangelo and part raphael lot part raphael but she's got a lot of raf there yeah, yeah she's she's not like the same character and i'm like that's kind of cool you know and, and i and like that about her a lot i think the turtles always made anybody who felt like an outcast feel like they had a home but i feel like jenica really makes other people feel that way because she she didn't grow up with them she's not part of that brotherhood right yeah so it's for those of us who are on the outsides of other families, other groups of friends, other things, and we don't necessarily feel accepted yet. We are in Jenica's shoes. And I feel like she made me relive, you know, being a teenager all over yeah. again. And I, I love the turtles because they always made me feel like you could find a home, even if it's unconventional and your dad is a rat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even, even strange people can find homes. Right. And I feel like with Jenica, it, now that I'm 40, right, and I, I'm starting different parts of my life over, I feel like on the periphery of some things, and I feel like she made sense to me and made the turtles make sense all over again. Nice. It's, because she she is that character, and I think we can all be in her shoes at some point in our life. Hey there, Turtle fans. Check out BigCountryComics.com for the exclusives and variants that you're looking for. Featuring the art of Mike Ruth and Hugh Rookwood. You can find graded books, Funko Pops and Figures, statues, even Big Country Comics exclusives, books from Aftershock, Boom, Image, DC Comics, IDW, everything from Swamp Thing to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle covers. You can get them raw, remarked, signed, even slabbed, available at BigCountryComics.com. Don't forget, buy one, get one 50% off on graded books. And dudes, be sure to use our code EPICSHELL for an extra 15% off of your order. Check out BigCountryComics.com. Yeah, no, I, I think that's perfect. And, and this is by far the most philosophical episode that we've done. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, no it's, it's great. And, and, um, and with, with this, I mean, it's great to have like a good perspective on what Jenica means as a character and just how she, she represents uh, the things that she does because we, we don't usually get that. Like most of the stuff that we get is like, Oh, I've got to, I've got to kill this person and I've got to assassinate this. And that's, that's all kind of that you see in the beginning parts with her. And it takes, like I said, a good two and a half to three years for them to develop her. And then at that point, is she defined by her relationship with Casey or is she defined by her relationship with Splinter? 
you know, different kinds of relationships, obviously. Even has like a, uh, not a, not a romantic relationship, but a relationship with Mikey, where I remember, you know, Mm -hmm. at one point they got ice cream for all the kids. So she's, she's this interesting character where you never know what she's going to do because she was so deeply loyal to Splinter, but then she'd do something kind that was kind of out of the wheelhouse of what she's supposed to do. Exactly. Supposed to behave. And she's supposed to be a hard ass and all that, but she has that that uh deep sort of empathy for things and people and all that and that, that comes back uh we'll definitely have to do another jenica episode and all that. i'll have to have yeah. you back for that i'm one. thinking about the battle of the bands that we mentioned <laughs> oh earlier, yeah but i'll drop it for now <laughs> april was there april was there but but go, going back to to april because we're talking about april and april at this point is the fifth and female ninja turtle she wakes up oh no no oh, no more pizza at bedtime strange dream like my reality it, it just isn't strange so and, and we're seeing her she wakes up and you know she's got her long red hair this is the idw version you know we, we see her and she's sitting in the van um very very classic she's sitting in that yellow volkswagen turtle van wearing and, a um, yellow shirt <laughs> yep totally again coated yellow you know it's april you're gonna know her because of her red hair and she's wearing yellow Yep. And she's talking to the turtles and they stink. And we, we know this because they live in sewers. And this I'm just glad that someone addressed it because it's one of those things they must smell. You know, they're teenage boys. And yeah. They're amphibians. Oh, yeah. yeah. Reptiles, not amphibians. <laughs> and she's she's messing with the air freshener and all that. And uh, we get a little a little bit from Mikey. And, um, you know, um, let's see. And Raph is like, hey, April, you got a hula girl to go with that palm tree. <laughs> Good she take one you. sniff and run away in fear. My van smelled pretty ripe since I met you guys. And then Mikey goes, that's turtle power. And then Donnie's all like, not to brag about, not one to brag about. Sorry, April, my brothers aren't exactly masters of personal hygiene. Like you don't smell the same as the rest of us, Donnie. You know, so. <laughs> and then we get a little raft. So Donnie's trying to ease his brain by working on a Rubik's Cube. So we can see that he's uh, just kind of pondering and all that and He's he's telling them that you know they're they're pretty vulnerable living above ground. So I just this... want to say I love that frame of Raph because he even has his armpit out, like he's got his <laughs> hand up, like he's making it even worse on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a- absolutely. And um, it's it's so funny because I'm just reading this, and and I read issues 13 through 15, and I read this one because in the, in the reading order, this is just after. Uh, issues like 13 14 so then there's this one so i'm like oh is is that part in this or not so i had to like double check myself just to see so (laughs) but what what donnie's talking about is he is looking for another place for them to live where they're not going to be exposed living above ground in the uh second time around shop so most recently we saw that it, it was a problem because casey showed up and casey got just his face smashed in by his dad and you know it's at that point it's it's tough you know and everyone's in a tough spot and they realize just how how much trouble it's going to be if something else like that happens if the shredder was supposed to show up or anything and it's only a matter of time so so um donnie says uh, it's kind of helping him he's like look guys i don't know about you but think about it we're too vulnerable living above ground at april shop nothing stopping stockman from building another turtle tracker and finding the shop and then this kind of goes back to the micro series with Donnie, where Donnie was actually in in there and um, Baxter was trying in uh, stock gen and Baxter was trying to get Harold to use the turtle tracker to find Donnie. So that's why he's so about this. And, and the funny thing about the IDW series is nobody believes Donnie until they have to believe Donnie. It's just like they just think he's like outlandishly making claims and all that. And he's the most logical turtle all the time. And it's, it's funny because usually he's right. But, you know, this, they, they don't get it, though, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then they're like, it, it's funny, too, because they did the same thing with Leo. They're like, oh, yeah, there's ninjas following me. Oh, yeah, really? Ninjas? Yeah. And these are foot ninjas. So they did the same thing with him. They're just really skeptical of each other. So, <laughs> it's crazy. They act like he's just being paranoid. And, and they're just like, ah, oh, not the turtle tracker again. The same old story. It's like, oh, yeah, they're going to track us. You know, if, if we do that, we'll just we'll just take him out ninja style. And Leo reminds him, ninja style is subtle and invisible. <laughs> so, but um, let's see. So we, we get a little narration from uh, April who says that um, she's, you know, talking to humanoid turtles in her van and their verbalization alone is a biological anomaly, not to mention the ni- ninja training, which is another level of weirdness. 
my turtles are a walking, talking, successful experiment in biological engineering, or maybe just an accidental miracle. And I mean, she kind of touches on it too, but they're also people. They're the souls of people who were re reincarnated into these turtles that just happen to be there with their father, who was a rat at the right time in the right place and end up getting exposed to a mutagenic ooze that turns them into what they are. And, and that's the old argument are, you know, like, is, is it, uh, you know, nature versus nurture and, you know, the, the soul and stuff like that. So it's like super existential, this series, like the IDW one. It's just such a fresh take on it. I, I love that one so much. Yeah, I think I think actually it's my favorite origin for them because like there's there's the movie, there's the comic, there's the cartoon. And, yeah. and is like I used to I, I would probably tell you back in the day that the 87 cartoon was my favorite origin because they had him as the human and it made a lot of sense. I'm like, OK, yeah. that totally makes sense. But um, I mean, this one's just so much better where it's like, OK, it makes sense that they were all killed and that this and then Shredder's back because he's a ghost and a dragon okay never mind yeah well and, and their souls are hundreds of years old and yes. when you get into the whole backstory oh my god it's tragic like it, oh my god yeah when you when you go through and see of, the scene with their mom oh well and the four boys getting their heads cut off yeah like, it's come horrible. on like that is just whoo that's painful that's deep and they're back and he did that like he didn't have to do that but saki did that literally to torture his rival he did it. So, he made him watch. So yeah. You think about it. You're like, what's the worst thing that could happen to you in this life? Mm -hmm. I mean, for me personally, I'm not saying everybody, but it's the loss of your children. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. that's the most awful thing you could ever possibly do. No wonder they come back. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then, and then I'd you be so damn pissed off. I'd come back and haunt him to the day I die again. And, and, and you again have and again Donatello. Donatello says the the exact thing that that we're all thinking. He's the audience standing. He's like, if if we deserve to come back, why did they bring back Saki? Because he's the worst, you know. And and he says it. We all thought it. So it's like I'm glad that he's using that logic because it's just it's just crazy to think that such evil that existed in the world gets the Isn't same that? place as anything that's good. It gets that second chance. That's right. And then it goes into all of this balance of the universe. Yeah. For a comic book, it's pretty darn deep. Oh, it's so, your head, yeah, it's your head super is like, deep. Oh, my head. I have to think about this. Maybe I need a glass of wine with my coffee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just not sewer apple wine. So. Not sewer apples, no. <laughs> so um, April now is going back into stock gen because she's got to work and she's she's talking about this. And, um, you know, we're taught as scientists to maintain a dispassionate observation role, which is kind of what we were talking about before. Um, yeah. It's how I handle stress objectively and uh, to analyze, use science to shield my heart. But I can't do that with the turtles. I feel too protective of them. After all, I name them. The biologist in me is fascinated. How many variables were there involved? The length of exposure to the mutagenic agent, interference from the foot ninja contamination, the alley environment. The friend in me wonders, becoming, becoming lucid, aware, more human, did it hurt them? Now, my turtles live like fugitives. We did that, good old stock gen. I used to believe in the purity of science, the process of experimentation and the replication yielding reliable results, adding to the wealth of human knowledge, studying the beautiful mysteries of reality. But that's crap. I'm finding that the corporate science is just as corporate as any other big business, and they can track the turtles down. They'll probably vivisect them and sell them to learn just to justify it as science. So I can't let that happen. And I want to lead, leap into action and help. But that's not my heart leaping. My, my head i need to plan so now we see what she's kind of uh gonna do and she didn't it didn't seem like she even told them what she was gonna do but she was definitely influenced by what donnie said earlier and if you notice donnie was sitting in the front seat with her so yeah. they they definitely have some sort of bond and it's probably over science and logic and things like that so he he I, feels comfortable to talk about things around her i really like that they get to her heart and not just her head and if we think about all the, the films and the other comics, it's always been so important that Splinter named them. Like, yes. And here we have her taking on almost a father figure. She's the one who named them. Like, that was big to me. That's why she's so attached, right? Like, that's that's huge. And she says as much. Yeah. Heck, I named them, you know. That's it. it and that was typically Splinter's role, right? The naming. 
And here it, it makes more work. sense here than it does like, oh, I, I found an old Renaissance painter book. I'm like, OK, well, yeah. technically some of those are not Renaissance painters. So you know, it's like not that I'm going to hold them to that standard, but it's just like like, OK, it kind of makes sense that April would do this and do it based on, oh, I really like the work of this person. That's so. it. And there's always so much pride when the turtles get introduced and they're given um, their names are given to the audience. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, huh, so she's responsible for that in this. Isn't that cool? That's that's it just such super a cool, such a cool thing. And um, so she's got a plan and it looks like she's going to try and use her position as an intern at StockGen to get a hold of that tracker. And it's going to start with, uh, she says, but she, she, um, I already know StockGen's got a scientific dark alley. The turtles are proof. What's missing is evidence, which has to be here somewhere. How can I find it? I'm not a ninja. And I, despite Casey's help, I'm not really a fighter, but I could be a spy. So she sees that uh, another woman that's roughly uh, the same size and height as her. It's just dropped down her badge and she sneaks it into her lab coat. And then we see Chet, Chet show up. He's uh, He's such a goof. You know, it's so funny. It's like a lot of the stuff would not happen if not for Chet, who is definitely like the shaggy of this. And I expect like him to be like, hey, Scoob, I mean, Dr. Stockman, you know, it's like, he's like, a, he's a hippie and he's, he's a scientist. It's so funny. So and, what's your and, Chet voice? Um, I think, I think Chet is just like, uh, so this is the tea turtle tracking, you know, just like, like kind of basic. I, I didn't have anything like specific. <laughs> I know he's not like he does come back later on, but, you know, I, I yeah. haven't really, you know, I guess I guess I put more into the Baxter than him. But, you know, um, Harold is kind of like this. But Chet was just kind of, you know, so the tracking T unit exactly does this detect the therapist. Uh, good morning, April. You know, he's just kind of he's kind of dopey. And it, it's funny, <laughs> you know, you, but but the thing about him is that is so interesting, too, is that he's OK with all of this bad stuff happening and. Like he's a nice guy too, which is really weird. You know, it is like, really weird. I think it's because again, the science part of the brain takes over. Like, you know, while we've talked with Donnie, like sometimes the moral compass gets confused because of the genius, because of what interesting science this is. And I think that's Chet's problem. Yeah, he's he's definitely got some problems because I mean he's always playing second fiddle to Baxter and he's trying to get this approval and I mean he's seen some weird stuff. He's he's participated in the psychotropic stuff that he's pumping into the rat and he knows about this and he's been there with Hob like he's been doing the tests and all that. He is in as much as you can be in in Stockgen. He's in and he's still trying to be a good guy, which is just as we find out is not going to work out for him. <laughs> Sadly not. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess I guess once you've seen like one rock giant talking to you yeah. on the turtles, yeah. uh, uh, any any idea of normalcy goes out the window. <laughs> yeah. And I mean they're they're pretty imposing looking. You know, they're like it, it reminds like if if the listeners haven't seen these yet, they look like Korg from uh from the Ragnarok film and from <laughs> uh Endgame and all that. That's that's what they kind of look like. Oh, that is so true. That's so a he, good one. He's got uh, a cup of coffee over here and he's got the turtle tracker, which he happened to be working on. He's just pushing around on like one of those old school AV carts. And, um, you know, April sees it and she's like, oh, I need a plan. I need a plan. And she thinks and she she reaches for uh, the coffee that's set down. She's like, oh, here, let me get your coffee. And she uh, does a, a sort of trip move and uh, fumbles over Chet. And he's, he goes and he ends up uh, spilling his coffee, causing a huge distraction and just like taking out the power, which is such a Chet thing. So it it's is such a Chet thing. It's really. so funny because she is so smart and clever that she made him feel like he did this. And this is something that he would normally do. So everybody's prepared to like blame Chet. And she's like, oh, no one's going to blame you. No one's going to blame you. And, and we look and we see that it's a big deal here because all of the tanks now with these uh, in this room now say failure, 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 you know, and kind of like this weird sort of like, I don't know. I, I think of like resident evil where they're making the monsters. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like that. And um, I, feel, I feel that like she borrowed a little bit from Baxter's book with this one, you know, with, oh, oh yeah, sorry, nobody's going to blame you. Like maybe she's been working for Stockman long enough that <laughs> she's learning some tricks. <laughs> oh yeah. And I mean, her interactions with Stockman become that of legend, like as we go forward in this, because like, she is like, she is Baxter's main antagonist as, as it goes forward and they start working together more closely. And um, 
I mean, Chet is just kind of like affable and he's like, oh, oh no, oh no, what did I do? What did I do? Nobody questions this because they know what a klutz he is. And April takes this upon her, herself to grab the, uh, the turtle tracker. So she she's completed exactly what she was looking to do. Nobody Only suspects a thing. Only person who listens to Donnie is April. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's absolutely true because you, you think about it. Leo fights with Donnie more than anybody like in, in as alike they are. And as much as they try to connect, they just can't because they're always, they're always trying to be heard between the two of them. Like Leo has, you know, the best interest of everybody. And he's like, Hey, we need to do it this way. And Donnie wants to think a different way. And, and that comes back in different times where they're just like constantly at odds with each other. Luckily they figure it out, but you know, it's usually that's Raph. So but um, yeah, in, get in a bro here, hug in the end. Yeah, bro hug and you know, fighting on a rooftop in the rain, you know, all, all <laughs> kinds of stuff. <laughs> but um, we get a little glimpse here of what's to come in the future from one of these failures, and we see a three-fingered hand that looks like a turtle hand. Yeah. So this will be the first appearance of a very special character. So dun, um, dun, dun. <laughs> back at the second time around shop in their little uh, room, we see that April is now talking to them and she says, not sure what they're planning to use it anytime soon, but it's safely smashed and now you can have it in your hands by tomorrow. So she took care of it. It's at the lab. She probably couldn't get it out. We see Mikey eating some pizza. Raph is pretty excited to hear this news as is Donnie and Leo and, um, I, I told you we need to pay attention to that turtle tracker tech. Okay, Donnie, you're not as crazy as we thought, says Raph. And you did good, April, says Mikey. And then uh, Don, uh, Donnie goes on, absolutely, April, but you shouldn't take any more risks on our behalf. You really think you guys are the only ones who should take risks, says April. No, but don't you want to get your hands on that tracker? If I get caught, just say I was curious about damage and then whoops, I used the wrong ID. Okay, just be careful. We see on the bottom part of the page now, it looks like this uh, turtle monster, as we see it, like the eyes are open. So it looks like it's waking up little by little. And, and this is the part that's kind of weird for me. It's like she works here, but she's going to sneak in at nighttime, you know, in all black and all that. It's kind of odd, but um, I guess she's going when there's fewer people. Yeah, I find that odd too. But, you know, you, she's got to do some ninja stealth, I think, to, you know, give herself some... Um, to feel really good about this, she's got to feel like she's part ninja somehow. <laughs> oh, maybe. Yeah. And, and I guess like like you dress for the job you want. So she wants to be a spy and she's dressing like a spy and all that. So there you, you know. go. You so, almost so, feel like hot woman vibes from this. Yeah, a little a little <laughs> bit. A little bit. Or um or from that Mikey mini series, the uh the yeah. CIA agent, you know. Yes, totally. So yeah, so she's that. like, uh, nothing to see here, just another jogger, pay no attention, nobody special. And uh, she, she's got her hair done up like the woman on the badge, and she's got some glasses, some horn rim glasses. So she looks very similar to her, just with different hair color. Again, the same build and everything else. So no one's really going to mention as she goes through. And she says, move along, move along, just an ordinary co-worker, back to check on the damage. That, um, you don't see me, um, you see me every other day, don't bother looking at that. And then she looks and she sees her first rock soldier who is uh, uh, just chastising Chet. You know how unhappy General Krang will be if the biological areas are not res res resecured soon. Everything seems fine. It was just a short circuit, says Chet. Hold on. That guy is solid stone. And Chet's not surprised. I thought the turtle tracker was something, but this is so much bigger. There's much bigger secrets here. As April goes in and she grabs the turtle tracker out right underneath underneath their eyes. Chet is oblivious. He has no idea who this is, even with the red hair and all that. He doesn't say a word to Chet's credit. You know, I guess this is where it works against him. And the, the stone soldier, what are you doing there? Halt, identify yourself. What's your name? I said halt. She goes, my name is out of here. As the alarm sounds, everything turns red and she is out down the hall. I love how she just casually strolls out, like keeping her oh, cool yeah. here. Totally yeah, no, she her. totally plays it cool. Like totally. And, and that's, that's like when you were talking about in the other one with the adrenaline and all that, like she's feeling it and she is just running with it, which is, is awesome. You know, she's just playing it cool. And she's like, this is my part to play and I'm going to play it. And, yep. and when she talked about that scientific objectivity it, earlier, that kind of comes back here where she's just out. Well, we'll she see that could have easily freaked going. out. Yeah. Yeah. As we keep going, we'll see like her own inner inner monologue. Mm -hmm. and we see that scientific cool really helping her out. 
do you want to do you want to take it and read this page like the oh, uh, okay <laughs> that'd be cool sure um so my april voice is pretty much my own voice <laughs> it's 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 a, a bit more accurate than mine so it's <laughs> there you go so on this page she says i revised my earlier assessment my name is now totally screwed no stone guy maybe he thinks i bolted for the exit where am i and at this point we see her in this laboratory full of large holding tanks that are full of green ooze um so in the next frame she says what is this genetic manipulation the turtles were only the beginning and from the looks of the damage and here we see one of these holding tanks busted up somebody else got tired of being an experiment she's looking at a whole bunch of little um test tubes here and she says i can't ignore what i'm seeing anymore and then we hear a large crack and a stone soldier standing there and he says to her i told you to halt man that's, that's a my best stone soldier voice <laughs> that's a good that's a good stone soldier i like it it's um <laughs> And I mean, this is this is a scary scene, like the, the way that he's lit from the bottom and you see the shadows and like the eyes are sloped and all that. Like he is imposing and it looks like he's going to crush her. And he's stone. He's scary as all. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I like that he's wearing khaki pants with a belt, though. I think that's no hilarious. Shirt. Yeah, no <laughs> shirt and all that. So it's like. You know, you get like the lower half of Peter Griffin and like the upper <laughs> part of like the thing. It's so it's so funny. It's such a weird combo, but I love it. It is a little, yeah. <laughs> oh, do you want me to keep reading? Yeah, it? yeah. Why don't you keep going? You're doing great. Uh, okay, so we have an alarm going off in the back, going free, 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 and we have the stone soldier encroaching on April here, and we see her thinking, "This is frighteningly familiar." Only I'm not dreaming this time. There's no way ex out except through him. Think, April. You may not have a shell, but you have a brain objectify and analyze so there we see her grab a tube from the wall and then she attacks the soldier with it and the soldier goes ah and we have all this um pressure coming out of the tube going Pshh. then we see april kind of make a run for it and she says to herself thanks for the self-defense lessons casey let's hope i ace my final and i just want to point something out there because I found this, although she's thanking Casey here, this is her own unique fighting style. Because <laughs> yeah. Casey, Casey is such a reactive character, and we see her th here analyzing everything here. So although she's crediting Casey, I want to credit April for her own actions here. And then I digress, and I'll go back to the comic right now. We have, <laughs> some, uh, we have some noises going on. We've got a clank and a creesh as this rock soldier is busting out of the lab now that he's back up on his feet. And April says, it's the oldest relationship in the natural world, right? He's the predator and I'm the prey, as we have a scene of him chasing her. I'm way outmatched, so I should be terrified. And I am. My brain just doesn't know it yet. Adrenaline is pretty cool stuff. Clears your head. Let's your body do what it needs to do in that fight or flight moment. And again, she's evading the rock soldier at this point. And we have the alarms going off in the bag. And we have her running for her life, thinking too bad it doesn't last forever. Pretty soon, I'm going to crash. Before that happens, I need to escape. And we have the rock monster in the next frame, looking behind him, looking for her and going, what? And he says, I'm in here. One of the experiments is out. Secure it before. Grr! And he gets something thunked against him. And we have the alarm going off again. The roo, roo, roo. And we have a shadowy form in the back that looks slightly turtle-esque, I'll say. Oh, yeah. Like, and, and I mean, those who know, know who this is. Like, we, mm -hmm. we can figure it out based on, like, the shape of the shell and all that. It's like, oh, yes. And this is, this is kind of his first actual physical appearance other than just the hand or the eyes. It is, and it's us going, oh, my God, you know who that is? What yeah. Is? <laughs> hey, hey, look who's here. <laughs> did you want to take the script from here, <laughs> or did you want me to? <laughs> uh, why don't you keep going? You're doing great. Oh, we, we've okay. only got, like, three pages left, so let's let's okay. uh, have you finish it up. You got it. So then, again, we have that lovely alarm. I'm sure everybody's sped up with me reading it with the re -re -re. <laughs> No, they, uh, they just asked for more. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> and then we have a bunch of stock gen cronies here. They're pretty um, non-impressive. 
you see a frame of April's boots so she's making a run for it. And then we see a little frame of her, her eyes peeking out of one of these stock gen suits. So she's hidden in a suit and she says, all clear. Thank God all clear, at least for now. We have that beautiful alarm that you all love so much. The baby. <laughs> <laughs> and we see a kind of turtle hand because we see the three fingers and it is holding something. It's holding a little palm tree. And then we have these stock gen cronies the hand holding the palm tree and the stock gen cronies are saying, you freeze. Meanwhile, we cut to April fleeing. I bet it out. goes well for them. <laughs> yeah, it goes really well for them. <laughs> then we have April fleeing in what? A yellow suit here. So this is just kind of a cool thing. And she says, I have no plan for getting out of the door, but it doesn't matter. It's abandoned. Whatever that Rocky going was yelling about, they're all busy chasing it. So I'm out with the tracker and more questions than answers. Typical scientific scenario. And then we see her fleeing stock gen in the night. It is creepy being out here this late. And then we see a door make a thump sound. But I'm not afraid of anything anymore. And then we see the door coming off its hinges. And April says, not after that. Now the door in the next frame is completely smashed and falling out. And April says, just sick and sad knowing what's really going on in there. And then we turn to the next page and ooh, we get to see the experiment gone wrong and it's super exciting. And April says, that's what happens when science goes bad. And now we see this mutated turtle with spikes on his back running through the night and April's narration is who knows what other beings they might torture into existence. What do, what I do know is who's going to be there to stop them. Four talking humanoid turtles and a hockey player with issues and me. And that's the end of this issue. Nice. And uh, in here, uh, you, you called it that uh, experiment. That is the first appearance of the, uh, the technically fifth turtle uh, slash. Yeah. So he's there and he's got kind of like his, his, uh, trademark appearance not from the cartoon so much but as uh from from like the early comics he just uh has like the two different color eyes and it's uh it's kind of interesting his appearance will change drastically several times throughout the comic um specifically in the real the real series because this is a micro series which mm-hmm. is is kind of like an annual but it's but it's canon but he's going to change big time like the way that they have him look and when they, they talk about how he's actually a different type of turtle, he's a, a snapping turtle. And it. I mean, it, it just, it goes on from here and he becomes like a major player. My and he's animal. big though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like when you look at this, you get the idea that this is a massive turtle and he's even got like the broken fingernails. So this is like yeah. a rougher turtle than what we're used to seeing. Yeah. His hands are just like gross. Like yeah. absolutely. Like, uh, you don't want to get punched by him, let alone have him touch you without some hand sanitizer. And, no, and he, especially like when he's holding the little palm tree, you're like, oh, that's a gnarly hand. That is not a happy turtle hand. And and that is 100% from the early slash days in the cartoon with his binky and with yes. um, <laughs> and with the, the comics where he was he was doing the same thing. And Krang was able to manipulate him by telling him where he can go and get palm trees. That's so, it, yeah. so that's an old slash trope, which is cool. I, I don't know. Did, nod. did they go yeah. into that as much in the 2012 cartoon? Because um, I, I know they didn't. I remember them going into that. They went more into in the 2012. They were more into focusing on Leatherhead. Yeah, right? yeah, which is yeah. which is cool because that was like a new take, and it's like, oh, this is pretty fresh. Yeah, and it was actually a very nice um, relationship he had. But Slash does not really play very much into anything. Yeah, and um, I know in the 2003 cartoon hun becomes slash so the only way we get him is because hun mutates at the last minute and and then surprisingly loves it so it's like all right cool you know of course you would though right <laughs> and i think that's just in the turtles forever uh movie yeah just found on dvd and i have to rewatch because it's awesome so but um if, if anyone's looking to watch the turtles i know if you have paramount plus it's they have the full series on there and you can also watch it on um i think pluto tv has a whole channel that that plays uh turtles all day so that's pretty fun. Oh, that's cool. I've never heard of Pluto TV. 
yeah, it's a, a free streaming service for television. So you, you can um, kind of watch shows and they have like a kid's show. So um, you, you can watch it and it's just turtles like for blocks and blocks and blocks of the 2003 series and the 2012 series. And there's just the only thing is they play incessantly like the they're like the same block of commercials. So if you yeah. don't get sick of hearing those like Archie scary mysteries, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it does, it kind of grates on you after a while. I, I'd stop listening to it during work. So I might be binge watching that when we're done this podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I highly recommend it. So, so this, this is a pretty good issue. I, I like the, the perspective that April's coming from. I like that again, she, we're seeing a strong, capable female character. She's being super reckless. So nobody approves of what she's doing and but they don't mince words about it. Stop her. No, like not at all. Plan, he's, Don, only Donnie's like, well, okay, but just be careful, <laughs> which is just very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like he feels that, that you know, she's not going to stop regardless. And, and I mean, usually this is like, this is like Raph and Kino from Secret of the Ooze, where it's yeah. like, they know it's a bad idea, but he's like, well, if I supervise you, it's less of a bad idea. So, But I mean, yeah. nobody argued with her and usually they'd be like, well, no, we, we need to help you. But I think it's interesting that this time they're like, well, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I was. Uh-huh. I like that they had the confidence that she could pull this off. I don't think anybody truly understood what she was planning on doing, and I, I get the the feeling on this this last piece where she went in there at night. I don't think she told anybody. I don't. I don't think she told them just how sketchy no. it was. Oh, exactly. She's like, oh yeah, I got this, no big deal. And it's like, yeah, why are you dressed like that? Oh well, never mind. So never mind cool and (laughs) this is this is so great because if you only read through the idw series and you're just going sequentially and you're like okay issues 9 10 11 12 13 14 you miss this and you miss the extra meat that they're putting on the bone here and that you're missing like the first appearance of actual slash and it's like this is such a worthy story and i'm i'm glad that in the collected editions and i don't know if you have where to put mine here it is I have the uh, the hardcover book of uh, Turtles Volume Two. From hey, IDW. look what I'm holding that's, up. That's we, what you're holding up. Okay, perfect. Look, twinning. Yep. <laughs> oh, twinning. Oh, look, they're they're going the opposite way. <laughs> but the cool thing about this is they do it in the reading order, so yes. you can you can actually read through these stories, and they're just so important. And it, it's it's funny because like when you read other comics, like I'm a big Daredevil reader, Batman, X Men right. from back in the day. You know, yeah. y- you wouldn't have something where it's like, oh, Wolverine 14 plays into X Men 261. You know, it's like, super frustrating sometimes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of cool. Like I'm glad that they did it this way, and I, I think that's one thing that the series has really done very well. And whether it's like you, you get down the road to like the Turtles Ghostbusters, which oh, that fits those. into something. Now, the it Turtles does. Batman does not fit into the universe anywhere. It's not. It doesn't. You know, but it's but, worth reading just for Damien's, <sighs> Damien's absolutely horrible reactions to the Turtles. I love it. It's the best. <laughs> like the, the scene where he fights Raphael is among like some of my absolute favorite. So and, it's, it's, it's gold. <laughs> Anybody who has not read it must go read this. I I um I, I was lucky enough to have Freddie Williams the second on the show and and we got to talk about all this and I, I just said to him like man you had no idea that when you were making this art and drawing this book that like you awakened the ten year old inside of me who <laughs> was like combining the two universes so I was just like you know ten year old jumping on a bed with action figures the Batman and the Ninja Turtles yep. like woo. <laughs> yep. spot on because i i think i would have been 10 just about when uh batman returns came out so oh, yeah. uh, absolutely so it's something you can relate to, to. in the theater <laughs> yeah 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 and, and on a on another uh note which is just kind of funny like a, a thing about like growing up and all that i have gotten to the point now where i like batman forever better than batman returns and you know it, to think about it like to say that back in the 90s you'd be like that's crazy and now i look at it i'm like huh that's a better movie i didn't even think about that you know what was the one with alicia Silver silverstone it was batman and robin and robin yeah i was gonna say you know if you said that was the better movie no. <laughs> that might be no. you know problematic but that's like great. that's like yeah i mean that's the given that that's going to be the stinker among them but it's just like you, you think about like all the things that they kind of threw up against the wall and batman returns and it's like yeah that's cool yeah that's cool that that's all right i'm like but it doesn't make sense. And nope. it's kind of weird. And it's like, all right. But then you get to the next one. And you're like, oh, this makes sense. I guess I wasn't expecting that. So, 
but it's that's but that's it. here nor there. That's that's for a full it, other podcast. That's so. like deciding which turtles movie is the better movie, right? Including the animated ones. <laughs> oh my god! So do you have a favorite? So do you, you open this this Pandora's box? Do you have a favorite? You really want to know? Yeah, <laughs> it, I, <laughs> I love the Batman versus TMNT because there are so many brilliant moments. Like I also think in the live action movies, if we could have a fight like Shredder and Batman. It would be the most epic fight scene ever. Oh, I, I, I thought agree. it was. I loved it, and I thought the the voice actors were great. I loved Batgirl interacting with Donnie and her refusing to call it like ooze. She had to call it mutagen because <laughs> ooze was gross. And Alfred interacting with Mikey, and in the end, you know, like being buddies with him. I love Robin in that one too because he hates the turtles. He's just a lot um, softer than we see in the comic. Because yeah. in the comic, he's such a little jerk. I love it. He's super petulant about like all these things. And just like, he's so entitled. And everyone knows that character now. Because that's like, he is the voice of a generation of comic readers now. Where oh, it's like, knows. all this stuff has been laid out before you. There's all this history. But here it is. And you still are acting like a little ass. So it's just it, like... It's- Brilliant. And I think my favorite part about that uh, animated movie is Mikey fangirling about everything in Gotham. Like, you know, he sees, he sees the penguin. He's like, oh my God, he has like an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> there are blimps everywhere for no reason. It's like all of these things we've all thought about Gotham and they get vocalized that way. I think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's brilliant. Yeah, I love I- that one. I love that. Um, it, it's funny because actually from that movie, I take the flip, the little it's pizza time from that Batman. That's that's my pizza time thing. I, I took it and it's a second long and that is in every podcast that I've done. So, so I'm time. totally with you. Totally. Yeah. And I, I love the scene where Batman just can relax and he understands these people aren't a threat and all that. And he just has pizza yeah. with them. And it's like, that's such a rare moment. Like you don't see that a lot. Like there's that side of him. And you saw it in the early 90s, but you don't see it a lot now. And I thought that was cool that, you know, he has the respect to let his walls down. He's like, all right, well, I have nothing to lose by befriending these people. And, you know, I really respect Splinter. And and Leonardo is the only one that lands a hit on him, which I just I love. You it know? is great. It's and so like party cool. in his bat cave. Like it is a big deal. Like nobody parties in the bat cave. Yeah. You think about it. Nobody has drinks there or appetizers. No, it's the turtles I mean, can have pizza. It's both it's both sterile and awful, like at the same time where it's it like is. you've got like guano from the bats and, you know, dust and things like that. Alfred keeps things clean as much as he can. But I mean, there are bats. Yeah, it's it's it ain't right. So. No, but there they are eating pizza and they even look like they brought a table out for it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, they're like a little happy family. <laughs> after yeah, you know. I'm, I'm with you. I'm absolutely with you. Um, and and um, I, I feel like this one gets not as much love because like the first one's so dark and all that. And it's like amazing, but like, I am a huge fan of secret of the ooze. And as like, as like cliche as everything else that I feel like at the time that I saw that in my life, it's like, like that one, it's like, I could probably watch that like a thousand more times. (laughs) I'm going to say that's probably my favorite. And that TM TMNT movie is pretty badass too. So that's like at least top three. So I think it's Sarah Michelle Geller who does April's voice in that one. Yes. Yes, it is. I absolutely loved it. And there's a famous actress who voices Karai as well. I just can't remember her name. And she uh, it was, was the, the girl from uh, uh, Crouching Tiger. That's it. Yes. Yeah. And she does. I love that they kept it. They, they purposely sourced an appropriate voice. And I think it worked so well. I loved that movie so much. Uh, d- don't get me started on the coding for the turtles because that's a whole other argument. And and I, I, had, <laughs> I had I had a discussion with, with uh, comedian Nore Davis on this on how like we both believe Raphael was was coded black, and I'm like I don't disagree with you. So I'm like you know, but but that's that's again in a whole other podcast. But um, you know, and he was really badass in that one. Like I love the uh, the beginning of that. Oh, so good, yeah. Like where you know he's got the motorcycle and he's just this Thank lone wolf. My latest eBay purchase. I don't know if you could see this, but I got one of the Stone Generals. Oh, right? nice! I got the uh, the the Jaguar Stone General for ninety nine cents. So I was like, yeah, I'm Whoa. totally getting him. So I'm only I just, missing. I just found her name. I was going to say Zhang Zi. Oh, Zhang Zi. Yeah, because awesome. I can't. And I'm going to look up again who voices Karai in the 2012 version, but I also love her voice, which is completely Oh, she's so voice. good. She's that just, is it's such Gwendolyn, a great one. Gwendolyn Yo? 
I believe. Oh, cool. I don't, I don't know her from, uh, from any of her roles or anything else like that, but such a distinct voice and such a distinct character, just like a yeah. really cool sort of, uh, like she's got like this, this punk vibe to her yeah. and she's somewhat flirtatious and all that. And it's just like, it's so compelling to watch those episodes. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> No doubt she will cut you. I love and, that. And she's betraying people, like, and she's betraying everyone. So she's like a total Kunoichi. So it's just like, this is crazy. Totally. Betrays April, Shredder, Leonardo, Splinter, like everybody, like, like Zex, you know, who, who becomes Bebop and all, like, like all of them. Like, she just like across the board messes with everybody. Like, wow, that, that's your Catwoman character right there. She's brilliant. I yeah. think she's such a great character. And like a good juxtaposition against April, who's very... Like we talked about, very led by a moral compass. April would never betray a hundred people in two seconds flat, right? I agree. Yeah, she just doesn't have that in her. So no, so it's they're like polar opposites and play so well against each other. Yeah, yeah, and and that's why it's so compelling to watch that uh, episode where they're fighting in the subway and all that. And you're like, April doesn't have a chance, but she kind of does, and she wins. That's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, we got one book left. So, and um, I'm, I'm running short on time. So let's, let's make sure that, that we can, uh, no, it's, it's, you kidding me for a great conversation like this, our listeners are going to go crazy. When they I'll keep it tight. So much in this. <laughs> we'll, we'll start off with this. It's, um, this is actually uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue number 118 story by Sophie Campbell and art by Nelson Daniel colors by Rhonda Pattinson and letters by Sean Lee. And just, uh, I didn't mention this before, but letters for the April new miniseries were also by Sean Lee. So, right. Uh, we start off and we see the farmhouse. So this is uh, this is after everything has happened and the turtles are, are kind of removed. They're at a farmhouse here. We see a uh, scarred, hooded character who we know to be Oroko Saki, the uh, reincarnated ghost sort of character who's looking on as an outsider. He says, time to leave, I suppose. Then all of a sudden there's this really big uh, energy anomaly that happens and it's Out of it steps the futuristic turtle who is a pale white turtle with pink markings and has a time scepter. And uh, we we know this to be Lita, who is the turtle. Lita is awesome. Just so so cool. And uh, she says, Uncle Saki. And she goes on to give him a hug. And we can see that she's got like all these tattoos on her arm stuff, too. And it's all in that same like white and pink color scheme that she has. She goes, what are you doing here? And she's, I'd ask the same of you. But now I thought you'd be helping uh, the clan with Karai and Jenica's uh, musical situation. So as we talked about that, um, uh, no, that's uh, I'm I'm here. Uh, did I pick the wrong time? Because she's clearly traveling with uh, through time with that time scepter. And and Saki says, no, I don't believe so. The turtles have already left for New York. Oh, no, I thought they'd be here by now. I'm so dumb. Time, as they say, is shifting. Uh, You just have a long walk ahead of you, he says. Oh, how come you're here all alone? And he says, I've been looking after the Hamato family during their time of mourning. I've been looking forward for ways that I can help. I I retrieved their cat when it was lost in the woods, tending to Yoshi's grave, but I promised Yoshi I would look after them, and I was unsure of how to approach them without being seen as their enemy. And he's exactly right. I don't think that there is a way that Rokosaki the Shredder can approach any of them at this point. The most open-minded of any of them would not believe him. And, and that's why Lita is so important because she gives this future perspective where things are going to be okay and things are going to be different. And she brings that information, which she's not supposed to do because she's pretty much influencing the, uh, the past by what she says from the future. What would Doc Brown say? The time space continuum? Oh yeah. Like, it, you know, in, in Doctor Who, the tiny, wimey, wobbly, gobbledy, you know, it's like all that. <laughs> but she says, you know, she gives him some reassurance and just lets him know that returning clunk was huge and, and thanks for that. And, you know, keep doing what you're doing. It's the little things that matter. And we're going to see that in this issue. It's mostly about the little things that he does to help, even though he's kind of like a incorporeal ghost at this point. So he says, and he actually thanks her, which is, is this is such a different version of the character that we've seen. So. It is, but I was going to say he does, he it's kind of a bizarre thing because he can touch things. Yeah, he, he can definitely touch things and, and all that, but he also walks through walls and does weird stuff, and you can't actually see him unless he wants to be seen. I always wonder about the rules about that. I'll know I'll never get them, but I feel like asking, you know, in your undead, yeah. alive, ghost state, what, what can't you do? 
That's a great question because I mean, they can hear him because he completes the song for, for Jenica and you know, they, they can see him at some point, but yeah. I wonder if it's like, like the movie ghost or is it like, uh, you know, uh, frighteners, you know, where you can only it's- see him if you've had a near death experience. Does he use magic points every time he becomes visible? You know what I mean? Oh, clearly. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> that cloak is a plus two, uh, magical. <laughs> yeah. He has to roll a 20 sided dice every time. <laughs> roll constitution, please. Yeah, I like yeah. that. That's, that's what I'm going with every time he has to make a, a, a save. So. <laughs> so, so we, uh, we go to Donatello who is working and this, this is kind of fun because it shows that he types with chopsticks which is hilarious because uh, with those big meaty fingers, he probably can't type well unless he has a modified uh, board and he's just looking at a standard uh, laptop. That's kind of fun. Um, just let me finish writing this chapter, okay? I'm really making progress. As he looks onto the three weasels that uh, have their pink, um, what do they call them, bandanas. bandanas. So yeah. they've been training at the Ninja Dojo with uh, Raph and Alapex and Leonardo. So they're, they're apprentices. They were going to be assassins originally for the foot, uh, trained by Karai. Or, no, they were trained by Hob, right? Yeah, I believe Hob. Yeah. Not I think Hob trained them, and then um, yeah. they were supposed to, to be assassins. But it didn't quite work out, and basically everybody's friends now. So Donnie takes his time to go back to get more tea, and these guys are drinking their uh, orange juice, it looks like, through a straw. And they <laughs> fight just like the turtles do. And Donnie's talking about, he's, oh, I really got to remember to back up this book that I'm writing. And luckily, Saki sneaks in at the last moment to save this from that liquid and then cleans it up. And the weasels all look at him like, what the heck is happening? As he cleans that up and then puts down the laptop so it ends up being unscathed. Donnie comes back. All right, back to work. So and they're just looking on like they don't know what to say. And these guys don't really talk much. So no, they you, don't. you don't get much from them. They're not going to say anything. So and then Saki has done his, his deal. Moving on to the next one, we see Leonardo, who's taken up his hobby of gardening, is uh, just hanging out. And um, there's he's whistling along, and he doesn't realize that there's a crack, and like one of the boards is going to fall, like the side sports. But uh, Saki goes in, and he just puts a little uh, little shim of wood in there, so it just stays up. And Leonardo is none the wiser. So just kind of like a little a little thing as he he looks around and if anybody could see Saki, I bet it would be Leo because of the connection that they had and everything else. And he thinks that he feels something with that sort of ninja sense. He turns around and it's just a mist and uh, and Saki just disincorporates and he goes, I never get used to the tune. I'm never going to get that tune of Jenny's out of my head. And, and that's that's it. Saki moves on to the next spot. Why don't you pick up from this one? Okay, so we see there, we see Jenica with her guitar in hand, and she says, no, that sucks. That's not right. Dun, 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 dun. Why can't I get this riff right? Ah. And then we see like this spectral Saki over her shoulder, and he just whispers this perfect music note. And she says, yeah, that's it. Killer riff. And she starts going off on her guitar. That's how Keith Richards does it. That's how Keith Richards does it. He has, he has a Roku sake whispering in his ear. <laughs> or maybe it's like Ozzy Osbourne or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well, I imagine you wouldn't be able to understand Ozzy. Like, <laughs> Turtles. <laughs> You'd be like, what? What was the note? <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> um, then we go to Jenica um, doing what looks to be like a podcast, something like what we're doing right now with another mutant she's more of a cat mutant oh yeah, that's and- uh sally who's the lion right and she's on um she's talking to mikey Thank right you. yes oh it is mikey not jenica sorry and uh i couldn't remember her name i was gonna call her Susie. <laughs> yeah no well you're close you're close that's uh that's <laughs> sally so she is uh she was with the mutant animals and she's yeah. kind of the figurehead leader which makes sense because she's a lion you know um, she yeah. just kind of fits that mold but um you know but she's, she's a female super passionate. Lion, so she's gender smashing yeah yeah there yeah <laughs> so sally not Susie, says the rally's gonna be held outside the mute animals building right where they can see us and mikey answers this is my bad mikey voice i'm sorry it'll be small but hopefully the first one of lots more so tell your friends guys let's make it huge and sally says definitely we're all still pretty scattered here in mutant town but I want this to be the first step in making this our own place. I want to make things better for everyone. No more squalor and fear. 
And we have Oroku Saki just kind of mystically appearing in the back now. And we have Mikey saying, we got to get enough people together and make real trouble for Hob. And Sally answers that with, or, you know, rally enough of us to just storm in there and kick Hob and his goons out. Send him back underground where he belongs. And Mikey says, um, okay, well, word of mouth will be really important. By the way, bravo on the Mikey voice. I'm loving it. <laughs> I so tried. <laughs> Only for you will I attempt I love it. I love it. <laughs> and then um, in this one, we don't really know who this is. Just uh, I, I don't know who Lola Cruz is. Do you? Like, I don't. Is she well, significant? She's Lola Cruz. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> clearly. No, I don't know. I don't know how significant she is. Um, I don't remember seeing her too often. I think we see her a couple of times, and she's just basically filling this role between communicating between Mutant Town and the rest of the town. Mm-hmm. And I think I think somebody wanted to put a nod to a reporter in here. Like okay. we always have these reporter nods. You know, I think it's kind of a Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, and Saki takes and puts a uh, little transceiver radio there so she can pick up on their podcast and, and hear, uh, or at least their radio show, I should say. Yeah. And, um, you know, then she ends up uh, discovering the story. And I don't know, is she talking to, who's she talking to, her mom or something? She's, she's talking just to saying, her mama on the phone, Yeah. And first she starts telling her, you know, she's done with this mute animal story, not mute animal story, but mutant town story. And then at the end, she wraps it up with, you know, everyone needs to hear this. And she's got a story in mutant town after all. Mm-hmm. So yep. the press is going to go to this. And my favorite part is uh, on the next page where April is just absolutely stuffing her face with a donut. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. And, and do you notice that her hair has changed dramatically too, like from when she's changed roles? Like uh, when she starts out and she's got kind of like the long hair and, and yeah. she puts up in the bun when she's being all covert. This is like another two and a half years after that story. And now she's got it. It's, it's kind of like a more confident curly look where it's tied back because she's, you know, she's at work. She's working for the mayor and all that. But yeah, and it's big hair. Yeah, it's, it's super big. It's like it's like, hey, notice me kind of. Oh, very much. Like I'm important. And then we also see her in like the April and Casey series. She's got like the nice little pixie cut too. She does. Yeah. And I always thought that was a good look for her. It is. I mean, her hair sometimes, I guess they make decisions based on where she's going as a character. No, she sure grew it back quickly, didn't she? She sure did. (laughs) Maybe they're extensions. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, she gets paid well at stock, Jenna. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. So. (laughs) <laughs> but, um, we, we see here that uh, she's going outside. She sees the Null group who becomes a really big sort of uh, influence after everything happens with the um, with like the Triceraton War and everything. They, yeah. they kind of step in and it's it's led by like this absolutely terrible person who is uh, is named Null. And um, Null is working with uh, the mayor of New York, who is Baxter Stockman, because he won. Of course they are. And April is working for Baxter. And this is where, like we were talking about their interaction, their relationship. This is where it really starts becoming antagonistic. And, and like specifically in this one, it is like he is flat out trying to kill her. So she notices uh, that the, the remaining eggs will be transported inside the, the mutant zone immediately. And she's worried because she is the liaison to mutant zone. So she's the go between because uh, basically, if, if you hadn't read up to this point, Hob has set off this huge mutagenic bomb and uh, it mutated a good portion of New York and they walled it up to keep all the mutants inside. April is the one who's going between that with uh, Baxter who's the mayor. And what we're looking at here, she is aware that these are mutant fish eggs, specifically like moray eels. And it was a big problem when it was in the sewers. Like it was a huge problem that everybody had to deal with. And luckily they figured it out with the help of the turtles. But um, now she noticed that he has these and he's pretty much dropping bombs into, into mutant and someone's going to get hurt. And here again, we have the fiery moral compass. You can't do that, right? I just love that about her. She goes storming off. And we even have the hair acting almost as like a flame in this. Oh, movie, cool. Yeah. Right? Like, I feel like you you get a sense of how mad she is. <laughs> let's uh, let's act this out. You, you want to pick up as April and I'll do the, uh, the Baxter part? Oh, sure, sure. So this is right after the van. Yep. Okay, so she's, this is her storming into the office. 
So we have April storming into Baxter's office and she goes, Baxter! Please knock next time, Miss O'Neill. Tell me you didn't get a hold of slithery e of slithery eggs. <laughs> Excuse me, slithery? The eel mutant. I just saw someone in a no van picking up and a woman and... <sighs> ah, that would be my associate, Zara. That's unfortunate, as she walks in. <laughs> okay, I get it. It seems we've both been a bit careless. Baxter, you can't put those eel things into mutant town, and you can't give them to... I can do anything I like, Miss O'Neill. Fine, then. How about I take this to the media? Mayor Stockman breeding mutant monsters would make a great headline. I'm sure various outlets and journalists would be interested in your complicity as well. You seem content to sit back while my Mausers blocked off the sewers during the eel mutant incident. You've been very good at keeping quiet about that. I'd prefer if you'd simply walk away since none of this concerns you in the least. But unfortunately, you're quite involved at this point. Oh, no. And then we see that looks like there's these mutant dogs that have like these crazy clawed feet that come in right behind Zara. My apologies, April. It's just business. And then we have Zara getting blasted with what looks like to be a pepper spray or something. And she goes, Gah! oh, yeah. And, and Donnie must have helped her make this thing because this stuff looks absolutely brutal. And, I mean, and she, it's orange. Yeah. What, what do you spray that as orange? It's probably it's like bear mace, right? Yeah, this is scary stuff. But this is this is our April from the micro series. She's just she's thinking, she's reacting, she's assessing the situation, and she's taking it head on. You know, she she, she feels she can care. Yeah, and she I does. That's, that's in her purse. Like she had Casey give her lessons before, and in this case, this is a very April weapon. It's and she's wearing appropriate purse. footwear, so they're not yellow, but yeah. <laughs> they're not yellow. <laughs> that's true. But again, we have her hair. I love I love her hair in all of these. It seems like a very superficial thing. But if you look at it, the more mad she gets, the more it like whips around and looks mm -hmm. flame like. And it's really cool. Yeah. And I wonder how much of that's intentional uh, or, or even just subconscious, because I, I wouldn't have thought of it. But you're absolutely right. Like it, it does. It, it seems to represent what she's feeling at the moment. And I like that. And this, uh, this Zara is no joke, man. Uh, I'm telling you, she just went and kicked down the water or jumped over the water cooler and kicked April in the back. She's caught up to her, even though she can't even see. And she's smashing her face on the ground. And they are in an all out fight. And it's nasty. And uh, we're mentioning again, whatever she sprayed onto Zara, it's stuck on her face. It's like oh, a yeah. mask. So, whatever Donnie designed, holy crap, is it ever powerful? Yeah, yeah, and um, April decides to finish the fight by hitting her with a cork board. So it, it seems to have done the trick, and very similar to issue number two, she escapes down into the sewers, because apparently most buildings have a doorway that leads into the storm drain. So I don't know, maybe it's an older building or something, but uh, she's down here, and she has just gone into the belly of the beast, where there are now three of these eel monsters, which is the same as the three mousers that were chasing her in issue two. Well, even if you look at their mouths, they almost look like the open jaws of the mousers here. Yeah. They just, they totally adapted the story here. Yeah. And they've got like the little one eye on the top of the head with that mechanical device attached. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And, and their mouth, their mouth does have that little cleft on top. So it looks like that. So it really does. Yeah. So she's, she's running away and one of them uh, grabs onto her leg and we hear a snap. So I take that as it not only just bit her leg, but her leg's probably broken at this point. Yeah, it doesn't look pleasant. So, and, and it's bleeding profusely. And if you know anything about eels, they actually have uh, anticoagulants. So she's going to be bleeding for a while until she gets something to take care of that. So it uh, looks like uh, Zara is back with Baxter, who managed to get the stuff off his eyes. It's still on both of their shirts, though. And okay, they're their looking... eyes, if you look, are very puffy. Like yeah. Oh, like yeah. Swollen, which they I look like they're punched. So, <laughs> but now they're looking at this screen, just like Baxter was looking at when he had uh, chased her into the, um, into the storm drain and the turtle saved her, but he can't see what's going on because it looks like she's about to be saved by someone or something, not the turtles at this point, but something's taking out those cameras. Yep. 
So it's, it's kind of a spectral figure that's working very quickly to take care of this. And all we see is an outline and um, Baxter says, who is that? But we can see who it is. It's the ghost of Rokusaki who's standing there in the storm drain over three of the completely defeated creatures. They're just there. And then um, April's like, oh, and she looks back and he disincorporates into that uh, greenish black mist. And then he's just gone. And then we have uh, all of the, as Zara is standing there looking at some data and uh, on like a little pad and Baxter's, yes, this is Mayor Stockman. We have an urgent situation. And then that's it. It's uh, we go from there to the dojo where Alapex is there with Wrath. And if you want, uh, why don't you take us home on this one with these uh, couple pages? Okay. I think this is really kind of cute. We see how, how young they are and how playful. So we have Alapex here holding a bow staff and she's teaching the youngins and she says, are you bummed about babysitting instead of doing security duty at the rally? And Raph answers, and I'm sorry about my Raph voice, everybody. He goes, nah. <laughs> so Alapex says, you're good at this stuff. You're good with kids. I am. Yeah, you're practically a dad now. What? You're so domestic now. Ugh, don't say that. I am not. And Alapex then says to him, Big Leader really got my imagination going, though. Maybe we'll be married in the new future timeline. Papa Raph and Mama Alapex. Ugh, I was thinking more about Lita saying pepperoni gets mutated. That's way cooler. I hope I'm not still fated to train her as a master assassin, even though she'd be the cutest killer for hire. And here we have pepperoni on, on top of some lockers looking absolutely adorable. I and love Raph pepperoni. Is, <laughs> she's so cute. And we have, we have Raph say, hey, I really hope we fixed all that crap. I don't want us to be arch enemies. And Alapex says, oh, we won't. And then Raph tells her, and I think this is just very funny. I don't want us to be married neither. We're still kids too. And she says, ha, you big jerk. It was just fun to think about it. Lighten up. And then we have April come into this dojo full of leaking ooh, like mud and probably eels ooze or something. Her leg busted and bleeding and she can hardly stand up. And Raph says, April, holy crap. And she just says, hey, and you can imagine she's about to collapse here. Even Pepperoni's surprised. Yeah, Pepperoni looks absolutely shocked here, as do the little trainees. And then we flip to the next page, and we have Raph holding her up. And he says, what happened? Who did this to you? And she says, Baxter. And then we have Baxter Stockman on the phone saying, I am pleased we have the EPF's corporation on this. Director Bronze, thank you. I hate to report this sort of thing, but this individual has been contaminated by mutant zone exposure and should be considered highly mutagenically dangerous. She must be contained within the wall at all costs. If she attempts escape, please do what must be done to protect the rest of New York. Yes, my associate is sending the subject's information and appearance rover right now. And then we see a wanted kind of poster on a tablet of April O'Neil and the sign on the bottom saying mutagenically contagious, threat level one. And we have Baxter finishing off this conversation, but thank you again for your assistance director. Have a great weekend. Oh, I totally want to read all of the scripts that they have there under her name. So, and, and it's her picture, her mugshot with the hair that she currently has right now. And this is just like at the end of that issue too, where it, you know, uh, it just kind of ends and you're like, what's next? Exactly. That's like, pretty cool. oh my God, she just, you know, just like surviving the Mousers and Baxter, same thing, just survived Eels and Baxter. What happens it, now? Exactly. Exactly. So um, usually what I do at, at the end of the stories and all that, I mean, we, we usually just go over and um, then I'll, I'll kind of do uh, a pizza time and all that. So oh, my the question, pizza time voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't do a voice for it, but he goes, it's pizza time, you know, like yeah. that. But um, I always like to ask my guests what their favorite pizza is, like what, what they get, anything like that. I've gotten some really cool answers before, but uh, I'm interested, uh, Libby, what's your favorite type of pizza? Okay, I am very strange in that I do not like pizza sauce. I don't like any tomato sauce whatsoever. I find it repulsive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I am a huge pizza fan. So usually I lift up the cheese and I scrape out 
the insides and then I flap down the cheese. But I actually found, I believe it's Pizza Hut has like a chicken Alfredo pizza. Yeah. So yep. they actually put Alfredo sauce and this makes all the difference. So I really like the chicken Alfredo and I usually, I'm weird. I ask them to put a lot of spinach on it and mushrooms. Oh, interesting. And okay. leave the chicken out. So it's basically chicken Alfredo, with no chicken, and instead spinach and mushrooms. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's cool. I actually just had, um, I had a carbonara pizza, which was very similar sauce. And it had like uh, bacon, chicken, and it didn't have any peas on it. But, uh, you know, that, that's what I actually had. And I had that white sauce. So that's, that's cool. So um, I, I did uh, the last episode. I think we did the, the snowmageddon pizza, which is a white sauce pizza. So it oh, could nice. not be more relevant. So that's pretty cool. So that is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I love pizza. I make it all the time for my kids. And cool. But I kind of shudder when I put on the the tomato sauce. It's not like, a fan of that really red berry. Yeah, I can't watch. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we covered a lot of stuff. That's awesome. I'm so glad that, that you were here, that we could go through this. It was great. Like we talked about a lot of philosophy, a lot of the characters, things like that. Um, you have a really fun Instagram account. And, and I know like there's been some cool art on there. Um, you. Do you like, do you like folks to follow you on Instagram in terms of like, uh, like that? Well, um, oh, where I love can people it find they you? Um, they can just find me at channel six chick on Instagram. Um, if you look me up by my name, I believe it shows up too. And my first name is Liddy and last name is Waters with two T's. Uh, I love it when people follow me. I love it when they say hi um, and tell me, you know, why they love turtles or what their favorite turtle is or anything like that. I'm more than happy to talk turtles with anybody who wants to. That's awesome. I'll, I'll, um, I'll post a, a link there. Um, and I'll, I'll link you in when, when I share the episode and all that on Instagram. So I just saying, I was, I was so happy to have met you to have been able to do this with you. Um, you're, you're so positive and just like your love totally goes through for like the, the characters and all that. And that that's, that's why I reached out because I was like, this person gets it, man. And I'm just so glad that you were able to join me on this. Oh, I'm really glad. Cause I do love them so much. And I feel like in a very cheesy way, Turtles have changed my life and I get to meet all kinds of cool people with turtles too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you could be one person could be like a power engineer and the other like me, you could have a background in English literature and somehow you meet halfway because you've got this commonality and, you know, you're both so engrossed in all of these things. So I, I love talking turtles with anybody and I'm yeah. thrilled that And there's something there for everyone. You know, I, you can, you can look into the Shakespearean aspect of this and, and develop it that way. Or you could say, oh, the technical aspect of this is, is really good. Or just the way that they cro- craft the story or the perspectives, like, like I was talking about in the art. Absolutely. That's really yeah. cool. I even had somebody bring up um, Joseph Campbell's um, book and it's all about heroes and mythology. Mm. And this person was applying it to turtles and successfully because there's a reason these stories are gripping. They're, they're universal in some ways. It makes sense. It actually, it follows that character model that he was talking about with like the supernatural aspect and all that. So it's like, it totally fits in. Yeah. And talk about like the descent into the underground, like, hello, Mm -hmm. they live in a sewer. (laughs) Yeah. That's so, it's so metaphorical, but also so factual. So it's like, yeah, that gets it on every level. I think it's just awesome that people can connect over them. Well, I I will definitely have to have you back so we could talk some more uh, psychology about this and just philosophy (laughs) and all that. It's uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, We did our first Mirage story ever on here. So um, with with that, I got to just uh, end this part and we'll move on to our pizza time. So um, thank you so much. You got it. Um, It was a pleasure. Hi, this is Adam, a.k.a. Casey Jones from Casey Jones Livewire, and you're listening to Epic Tales from the Sewers. Time for a knuckle sandwich, punk. It's pizza time. And now, in a segment that we call Pizza Time, where we discuss any Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle or pizza-related food, I give you Pizza Time. Today's Pizza Time is going to be called Berry Awesome. Disappointed by the dinky micro pies that they had at McDonald Crump's Pika Pecco Pizza, the Turtles made it their mission to create some seriously satisfying personal pizzas. Here's one of their favorites so far. Individual pizza crusts slathered with lemony ricotta and topped with fresh blackberries, raspberries, and blueberries. Here's your ingredients. Extra virgin olive oil for greasing. One and one half cups ricotta cheese. One teaspoon lemon zest. One pound ball pizza dough, homemade, or you can use the recipe from the Turtles Cookbook. One cup balsamic vinegar. Two tablespoons of honey. 
one half pint fresh blackberries, one half pint fresh raspberries, one pint fresh blueberries, four teaspoons chopped fresh mint leaves. Instructions. Place racks on the top and bottom thirds of your oven and preheat to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Rub with two heavy-duty rimmed baking sheets with a little olive oil. Step 2. In a small bowl, mix together the ricotta cheese and the lemon zest. Step 3. Divide the pizza dough into four equal-sized pieces and roll each one out in a four-inch disc. Step 4. Place the dough discs in the prepared baking sheets and spread the ricotta cheese on top. Step 5. Bake for six to eight minutes, switching the position of the baking sheets halfway through until the crust is golden brown. Step six, remove the pizzas from the oven and set aside. Meanwhile, combine the balsamic vinegar and honey in a medium saucepan over high heat and bring the mixture to a boil. Let it boil for seven to 10 minutes or until it looks like syrup. Remove from the pan and from the heat and stir in the berries. Top the pizzas with a berry mixture and garnish with the chopped mint. Serve immediately. Very awesome, dudes. Cowabunga, dudes! Thank you for listening to the Epic Tales from the Sewers podcast. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. This podcast has no affiliation with Eastman, Laird, Mirage Studios, IDW Studios, Archie Comics, or Nickelodeon Studios. This podcast is a member of the Dorkening Podcast Network. Check out thedorkening.com for other podcasts. Epic Tales from the Sewers is recorded by Justin Cooper and Eric Will. Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. We have very active lifestyles. It's not all wandering the countryside aimlessly or scaring passing motorists. And we all love a good cup of joe. And there's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. Bold, robust, delicious. It's coffee that can wake the dead. <laughs> With over a dozen different roasts and flavors, Deadly Grounds can satisfy the most finicky of coffee addicts. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. Hey there, this is JB. And if you enjoy Tales from the Crypt, then check out my show, Tales from the Podcast, where myself, and usually a very special guest, sit down to discuss the TV show, the films, the animated series, as well as the original comics. So check me out every other week on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and of course, at talesfromthepodcast.com. Thanks for listening, kitties. You're all a scream. <laughs>